Okay. Okay. Oh, you know, Pam, did I get opening? Oh, there they are. I need to open the opening comments. Yeah, they were a little bit lengthy because there's two public hearings. Okay. Um, okay. okay, so I'm good to go. I do believe you are good to go. We're recording. We have Amherst Media. You have a quorum, 632. You're all good by me. All right. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of April 19th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. This planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I'm here. Uh, Tom Long has notified us he will be absent this evening. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to mute yourself. <clears throat> for the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished. Residents can typically express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the time is now 6.35 and we'll go to the first item on the agenda, which is uh, the approval of minutes from past meetings. Tonight, we have two sets of minutes, one for our February 21st meeting and one for March 1st. Um, why don't we go with the February 1st meeting or February 21st meeting first um, and, and are there any board comments on that set of minutes? Andrew, I see your hand. Not, not for comments, I was gonna make a motion to approve. Okay, uh, do you wish to make that, com that motion? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I would like to make that motion. Motion to approve. Yes, please. Okay, does anybody want to second that? Um, Janet, you got your hand up second, but I suspect you have some comments. Do you wanna second it and then give comments? Yes, I'm happy to do that. So I'm happy to second, and I have two, um, a question and a correction. Okay. Or enhancement, maybe. So on page three, um, bullet number three, 
Um, it says, according to Mr. Marshall's tracking, 1,504 bedrooms have been created since 2010. And I wasn't sure if that meant dorm beds or just bedrooms in. That was know. that was beds in the community. Okay, so I would add that. Say maybe add in, you know, 1,504 bedrooms in the community. So I just was I wasn't sure. Yeah. And then one, two, three, four, six. I think it's the eighth bullet down. Um. I think this is a comment that I made I made and I it was that um it seems as if we have met the housing production plan goals for units but it's mostly for student housing that was my general statement and I would just so I thought it I think I sent some language to Chris just adding in goals for for units but it's mostly and just add that in there. Is that um, <laughs> I, I guess I would I would question whether the folks that built that would would agree that it was primarily for students. I mean, you know, we've heard, certainly heard Archipelago say that um, you know their their you know units are available to anybody in the market to live in Amherst. Yeah, I mean, I, we could talk about it, but I'm just saying this was my comment. Because oh, I, I, you know, I know Kendrick. Oh, I see. You commented yeah. that in the meeting. Yeah. So I think you know, to me, one East Pleasant and Kendrick Place are mostly students, um, and then we have all the things on Route Nine. So yeah, I, I mean, we could argue about the fact, but that's that was just my comment that it's mostly student housing. All right. I see. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, Pam or Chris? So that that was my simple ad. If that's what she said, then I think that's okay to include it because we include other things that people say, which may be controversial. Not everybody agrees with them. It'd be well, great if you reached I don't know that we can check with the recording right now. So, uh, you know, is it something we can vote on contingently or should we just delay the approval of this set of minutes until the next meeting? Contingency is fine. Uh, Chris, can we can we approve those edits and approve these minutes on the condition that probably you or uh, Pam agree to verify the that those were in the recording? Yes. Okay, Andrew. Uh, that's fine. I was gonna, I mean I was just going to say if Janet said that's what she said. I would. I don't know that we actually need to verify it turn for minutes. Um, okay. All right. Anybody else have any comments on the February 21st minutes? Uh, Johanna. This is totally your decision, Doug, but I was wondering whether we uh, might consider the minutes as a packet so that we only have to do the roll call once, like as a joint motion, um, but defer to you. Okay. Um, Chris, you see any problem with that, or would you rather have two two votes? I think you might as well have two votes if you can do it quickly. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, are there any more comments on the February twenty first minutes? I don't see any hands. Mr. Marshall, it's just a little unclear to me. Are we voting this contingent upon a fact check? Yes. Okay. For the two edits that Janet. Yep. Requested. Okay. Okay, um, so Andrew, are you okay with a friendly amendment to your motion that the approval of the minutes be with Janet's edits and um, and contingent on checking that those that she did in fact speak I, as she thinks she did? I'm I'm sure she spoke the way she thought she did. I mean, I, I'm I'm fine. Um, it just seems like it's extra work. I, I would I would prefer just to not have the verification in there and just say, let's okay. update it to what Janet said. With Janet's, with Janet's yeah. edits. All right, well, let's go ahead and vote. Uh, Bruce, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm a yes, and I'm yes to no contingent necessary. That's just okay. putting load on the staff. Yep. Okay, thanks, Bruce. That's, a, that's an aye, and then Andrew. Aye. I am an I, Janet. I am an I. Uh, Johanna. I. 
and Karen. Aye. All right, thank you all. That passes six votes in favor. Now we'll move on to the March 1st minutes. Were there any comments on the March 1st minutes? Mm -hmm. All right, Bruce. Uh, move to approve adoption of the minutes as uh, presented. All right, and Johanna? I'll second. All right, thank you both. Uh, any comments? Any further comments before we vote? All right, Bruce, I assume your hand is a legacy hand. So, uh, or do you want to say something else? I'll, uh, I'll vote to approve, but I do want to say, I, I, want, I want to make, I have a question at the end of this. So I'll leave the hand up for that. Okay. So it's a yes. Okay, thank you, Bruce. And we'll continue with our roll call vote. Uh, Andrew? Aye. And I'm an aye. And Janet? Aye. Um, Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Aye. Okay, once again, six in favor, no opposed, Tom's absent. Bruce, you had a comment you'd like to make at the end of this? It, it, really a question for Chris and, and, and Pam. I, I noticed uh, a number of times over in re since I've been on the board that uh, uh, having bulleted, uh, uh, having bullets in in lists and so forth, and Janet just brought it to mind because she counted down one, two, three, four. It's just, it's, it's, I think it's the eighth bullet. She said, um, "I would uh, suggest if it's there's no reason not to that instead of using bullets for lists, we uh, use numbers because it's going to make it a lot easier, particularly as we are remotely talking about these things. It would I think be easier to be clear quicker." if they were numbered rather than bulleted, uh, a suggestion, that's all. Yep, Letter, letters can also be used. So, okay, thank you, Bruce, for that. And with that, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is public comment period. The time now is 6.44. And uh, let's see, I often read the number, the, the names of the participants who are attending the meeting at this time. So I will read that and then we will open up uh, for public comment from the public. Uh, so this is the time to raise your hand if you had something you wanted to say about a topic that is not on tonight's agenda. So I see Elizabeth Veerling, I see Frederick Hartwell, Hilda Greenbaum, uh, someone with the words or the text H startup as one word. I see John W, Kaylee Brow, Mandy Jo Haneke, Mara Keen, Nancy, Rachel Belanger, Stella Yuan, Susanna Muspratt, and Thomas Hartman. Okay, so uh, I don't see yet any hands for public comment this evening. And so I'll uh, uh, make one more call for that and, and then we'll move on. Still no hands. Up. Oh. All right, H Startup has added, put her hand or his hand up. Uh, Pam, if you could move that person over. Okay, okay, H Startup, you are able to speak. Please give us your name and your address. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Hetty Startup. I live on Allen Street in Amherst. And um, I just wanted to raise the issue of whether the proposal tonight um, on the agenda is really the best way to address our two local historic districts and our um, historically recognized downtown area. Um, I haven't read the document in full detail, but I'm just particularly concerned about um, how these may impact areas that are particularly sensitive and also particularly rich in terms of their historic value. And I, uh, I hesitate to use the word character because uh, Hedy, character, Hedy, uh, yes. this is the time for comments on topics which are not on our agenda this evening. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the redirect, Doug. Okay. 
Um, I'll 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 stop right now. If you can hold that. I don't want to take up anybody later. else's time. <laughs> yeah. If if you have more you want to say later, we can certainly okay, sure. entertain Thank you, you then. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I don't see any other hands for our general public comment this evening. So the time now is 6.47 and we can move on to the next item on the agenda, which uh, is item three uh, regarding the zoning amend, oops, nope, 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 that's the wrong. The, the Amherst College Pavilion Project. Yeah, I need to find the uh, agenda. I'm looking at the minutes. Okay, yes, here we have it, the public hearing site plan review. Uh, so SPR 2023-01, the trustees of Amherst College, 425 Southeast Street, request site plan approval to construct a new wood-framed open pavilion at the Book and Plow Farm owned and operated by Amherst College and to relocate a portable toilet. Map 17B, parcel three and eight, in the RLD and FC and RN zoning district. All right, so the time is 6.48 and I see Tom Hartman and I think, were we not gonna be bringing over? There's somebody else. Rachel, I think is part of this okay. presentation. As well um, as Kylie Brow, if you could please. Okay. Absolutely. Kaylee Brow, yep. And Bruce, I see your hand. Uh, would you like to say something as we get started with this topic? You are muted. Bingo. Um, just a declaration that uh, the firm that uh, Tom's uh, in charge of these days has got my name on it. Uh, I used to work there. I see my desk behind him is uh, still empty. Um, so obviously I'm a hard person to replace, but. I haven't been there for eight and a half years, and I do feel uh, uh, quite capable of making an impartial determination. Okay, thank you, Bruce. All right, so with that, uh, Tom uh, and your team, welcome to our meeting this tonight. Um, would you? Uh, I, I, I would you like to make any sort? Would you like to make a presentation of the project? Absolutely. And I'd like to introduce Rachel Blanger. She's the project manager for Amherst College and Kylie Brown, who's the assistant Brow, who's the assistant farm manager. So I think they may have some additional information beyond what was in the application um, as a result of some questions I think that were raised recently. Um, pleasure to meet you. My name is Tom Hartman, principal here at Coldham and Hartman Architects. Um, on, on the common here in Amherst, uh, we've been before you many times. Um, so if I can, I'll give a short presentation and then we can take any questions. Okay, so um, just for your reference. So this is the parcel in question. Um, here's Southeast Street, here's the railroad tracks. The parcel is here. You come up an access drive um, and the book and plow farm is here. This road, if you can see my cursor, connects to the, um, the south end of the campus near the tennis courts. So it's not a very visible site to the public. And I think several of the people who visited with the planning board hadn't been there before at all. Um, here's a, a little reference of what the project is like. So this is the access drive coming up. This road goes over here to a higher vista. Um, couple of hoop houses and um, fields here. And so the entry drive comes here. And then there's a couple of spaces with gravel parking and overflow parking onto the grass that's here. So um, the actual site that we're looking at for the building is, is approximately in this location, okay? So here's an uh, uh, initial rendering of what the project is proposed to, to be. It's a small wood pavilion on a concrete slab, um, open with the exception of these screened areas on the, uh, on the entry side of the building. 
And another view, this would be um, looking from the south to the north of the building. You'll notice in the plans we provided, I'll show you in a moment, we have an alternate for a terrace here, um, a Goshen terrace with a retaining wall. Um, I'd like that to be in the permitting process, although at this time, uh, we don't think that alternate will be pursued. But my understanding is this permitting would be valid for two years, I believe. So in the event um, this does happen, um, I'd like to just make that a provisional approval um, if you're so inclined. Uh, so just generally here, let me zoom in a little bit. Tom, Tom, does that wall show up in the plans? It does. Yep, okay. I'll show you in a second. So here's the existing context. Here's the entry drive that comes in. We're looking at the site right about here. There's an existing portable toilet located up the hill a little bit. The proposed site plan. Um, again, there's that hoop house. So our, our structure is located right here. Um, the notion is that um, we have under 15 parking spaces, which by architectural access board does not require an accessible parking spot. Um, I believe the town may have a stricter threshold on that, perhaps it's 10. Um, but I've put in the, the application that we have approximately five spaces, which we can talk about a little later as to how they're defined. But the notion is that if a person was to arrive in a vehicle on site, we would use this level area to the east of the hoop house. And it's been designed so that the um, entry into the pavilion is on an accessible route. And we would relocate a portable toilet to be an accessible unit adjacent to the drive here because the, the, the grades up to where it was before are just slightly too steep. Um, so here's the base floor plan, 20 by 32 concrete slab. Here's the alternate that we propose, which has this um, small retaining wall and a Goshen patio. In addition to that, a very simple timber frame building, um, larger rafters, wood decking, asphalt roof, and um, the lighting on the interior of the building is um, mounted to the side of the rafters. So there's no um, light trespass above the roof structure. There's no outdoor lighting. Um, from the management plan, I can relay that uh, all trash and recycling are performed directly by Amherst College facilities. Parking, again, we're proposing approximately five parking spots. And Kylie can talk about how the CSA works and when people make those uh, pickups. No signage is proposed, no landscape is proposed, and snow removal is directly by Amherst College. So with that, are there any questions? All right, thanks, Tom. So am I right that the, uh, the structure itself is identical in the two alternates? Correct. So the only difference is the landscape. Yes, and, and, and how it would be integrated um, into the concrete slab. At this point, we're proposing, we're, we're gonna start construction as soon as we can. We're gonna do the 20 by 30 slab. So it might be a hard edge here. Um, and I think nothing would happen uh, this construction season. I think it's just a provisional for the future. Okay. Um, could you clarify about the parking spaces and the five versus 10 versus 15 and why you don't think we need a, an accessible marked parking space? Well, with respect to the architectural access board, if there are not more than 15 parking spaces, a designated accessible parking space is not required. So on that basis- Of, of Amherst, Amherst Town uh, you know, bylaw, I think we are more stringent than that. And what is the number? I don't know off the top of my head. Chris, do you know? The number is um, we, we would uh, require a handicapped space if there were 10 parking spaces. Um, in this case, there are only five parking spaces. And so a handicapped parking space would not be required. But um, the building commissioner would like to see a drop off. And I understand that Mr. Hartman is providing a drop off. Maybe he can describe that. 
Yes, and you can see in this um, image here, this is in my experience of being up there and, and Rachel and Kylie can speak more to it. This is the typical pattern of cars that I've experienced up there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you can see there's, you know, decent parking for three of them on gravel. Um, with respect to a, a drop-off location, I'm proposing that the drop-off would be in this very um, level area directly south of the, the hoop house. Which... So where are the five spaces are, that are that, that are being mentioned as opposed to the seven or eight or more? They're, yeah, they're happen? not organized parking spots. They're not marked. There's a gravel area for three. And then, you know, um, the parking occurs on the grass for pickup. So perhaps, um, Kylie, you want to speak about the frequency of vehicles and, and how CSA pickups work? Yeah, I can do that. Um, yeah, so as Tom is saying, we have a gravel space that's wide enough for three cars to comfortably park next to each other. We have um, a 75 member CSA share that runs in the fall. Um, we usually have pickups on one day, so 75 folks are kind of moving through over um, a several hour period. And uh, as you can see in the photo, it's uh, sort of how folks arrange themselves. They can also park up kind of along the road. Um, but yeah, we have like three, like space for a uh, gravel space for three cars and then everything else is just parking on the grass. So there aren't actually any spots that are striped on the premises? No, no. they're not. Okay. And then uh, about the porta potty, um, is this a year round or more than six months of operation facility? Each year, we we do keep it year round. Yes. And is the porta potty the only uh, restroom facilities on on site? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, as long as I guess the plumbing inspector is fine with that, because I know in my experience at the university, this would require a plumbed restroom. Um, I guess then. I don't have any more questions. And I believe there was correspondence with the plumbing inspector and with respect to a permit that may be required by the town. And there was follow up with Rick Mears. Um, and I think it was resolved positively. Okay. Chris, That's is that correct. correct? Yeah, Rick, Rick Mears, who's the Amherst College Director of Environmental Health and Safety, I know was in touch with Ed Smith um, a few weeks ago on this matter. Okay, all right. Good. So I see three hands for from other board members. Uh, Johanna, we'll start with you. Great. Thank you. Um, so first of all, um, yeah, thanks for sharing this proposal. I know this site really well, you know, have watched the farm come into existence and then have watched it develop. Um, it's very close to where I live and I ride my bike up that hill almost every day. So um, really familiar with the site. My questions are... I'm curious to learn a little bit more just about the function of the pavilion and what you see as the need and like how how will it serve the farm um, and the college. And then um, I was honestly a little bit surprised to hear that there would be power in the pavilion. Um, so it sounds like it will have access to electricity, which then begs the question, have you thought about putting solar on the roof or is that something the college has considered? Um, yes, sure, we have, yeah. uh, pardon me, we, we have considered it, and just for your reference, power, uh, the, the gear, electrical gear is right here, so it's a quick conduit over, um, but yeah, we, we have actually done a study, and it's well cited for photovoltaics to be brought in, we're providing the conduit to facilitate that, um, it's, it's a matter of um, funding and timing at this point, but everything will be set up. Um, and, and Kylie, if you want to talk about how you envision the, the pavilion will be used, it's been designed for 30 occupants um, and, and be used in very, a variety of ways. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, we, uh, as you can see pretty well in this picture, uh, we don't have a ton of kind of like covered non-production space um, for people to gather. Um, we have a lot of classes come up to the farm to do tours or um, lectures. Um, 
during the COVID pandemic, we had uh, this um, sturdy tent erected kind of uh, to the right of the greenhouse in this photo. Um, and it was used really heavily um, for students to just hang out together, um, but also classes were held there. Um, and it was um, a place for our crew to also gather. Um, so yeah, that we envisioned the pavilion, the pavilion to be used um, in that way, to have classes come, to run workshops, um, and to just be a nice and shaded space for students to be. Okay. Um, Johanna, any other questions? Nope, that answers them. Thank you very much. Okay. Next, we have Andrew. Doug, uh, thanks everyone. Um, I was actually just going to mention, uh, Doug, that uh, Karin, Chris, and I were were on site earlier this week, and oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that Tom did a great job summarizing what was there. I think the only pieces maybe that uh, that he didn't um, touch upon were the so when he when he talked about the two potentially the two phases of whether there'd be that kind of seating retaining wall or not is that. Uh, essentially, the, the the pavilion is essentially at grade with the gravel right there, and that um, as you move to the east, kind of across the platform, yeah, that's a good view right there, Tom. It's just that the that the, the natural grade will be brought up to the edge of the pavilion, so that there wouldn't be, despite the fact that there there would be a, a change in grade, it's going to be tapered in, so there's no need for any type of railing or enclosure to, to keep people in place. Um, the And then I guess the, the only other pieces we talked about were just there is some existing vegetation that goes along the service road. Um, yeah, you've got some of it right there, but yeah, that, that would largely stay in place. That, but those- It looks better than and, that, I promise you. <laughs> yeah. I believe though that those raised planting beds, you said that that might be cleaned up a little bit, Tom, but I'm, I'm trying to recall yes, one. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Um, with the, the fill that's gonna be brought in to create the level pad, our grading is gonna extend over here a little bit and the current flow of water on site drainage comes down right across here and we're gonna keep it coming down this way and then we'll push it around the corner on that side um, as well. And we have erosion control in our um, documentation with Tiagno, who's doing the work. So we'll be very mindful of that as well. And then I think the last piece was just, you had mentioned that you know, there's very little visibility from the road. We could see a car or two driving along Southeast Street. On my way, I, I drove past and took a look and yeah, it looks like it would be limited. And frankly, like it would actually sort of be in front of the hoop house. So. You could mm -hmm. argue that for folks who are glancing up there, it you know, depending on you know your sense of style, you might actually find that it's a nicer view looking at that that uh, architectural wooden feature as opposed to the hoop house. But oh, don't fan my ego, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but essentially just, <laughs> visible to to your point. So this really as you leave the entry drive and you turn left and go north on and go under the the next bridge. If you looked left at Stanley Street in the winter time. You'll see it, but you won't see it at all when it's leafed out. Okay, that's Doug, that's all I just had to say. Overall, very, very pleased with what we've seen. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Janet, you are next. Um, I just wanted to say what I think I heard you say, which is that there's three six parking spaces in that line. Three of them are gravel, and three are just informal that the ground is pretty flat. Um, and then also if there's extra parking, people go on the access road and park there. I'm not really sure, I, I'm sort of missing the information about how many people usually come during a pickup. Like, you know, is that like pickup on a Wednesday afternoon and 75 people show up or people come in dribs and drabs. So I'd like to hear about that. And then I'm also just concerned that if somebody did have a walker or a wheelchair, is it all flat enough that they could just pull into the gravel space or one of the dirt spaces and get out and make their way to the pavilion or to the pickup? I mean, what's your experience with that? And, you know, is there a problem with maybe marking out one wide spot for a handicapped person? 
Um, I, again, here are the three gravel spaces. Um, I, I don't think if I if I put a level on it that those spaces are are fully compliant. They're they're perfectly comfortable for an able bodied person getting in and out of a vehicle. Mm -hmm. This area right here is more level, and that's where we're proposing the drop off. Um, uh -huh. Adding signage for you know accessible drop off could I think easily be accomplished. Okay. Um, in that location, but it, again, this is all trap rock gravel, so we really don't want to get into I, marking specific um, spots. And Kylie, if you can talk about the flow of vehicles during pickup and and um, how that how that works. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, we it is kind of dribs and drabs over um, our CSA pickups run um, Wednesday afternoons um, from three to six thirty. So three and a half hour period. Um, it is sometimes, um, if you kind of look out at the park, like the parking zone, it can be a bit crowded, um, but we haven't had any like issues with people not being able to park or um, real congestion. Um, we have had folks um, with walkers and they kind of will park a little bit closer, like kind of right in front of the pickup and come out and get their veggies and um, get back in their car that way. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, um, for a space without any lines and any real um, structure aside from the three um, gravel spaces, um, it works pretty well. And um, we haven't ever had any, um, I don't know, accidents or problems or anything like that. And also just for reference, this is the parcel in question, but the adjacent parcel is also owned by Amherst College which is where the access drive comes in. There's the drive, the hoop house is right about here. There's plenty more parking spaces up on top of the hill as well. Um, but I don't think that that's been a, a, a concern at all um, in terms of pickup. And again, my experience of being there is that it's more or less three to seven vehicles at the most that I've seen there in a typical arrangement. And I'll just add, as it relates to the use of the pavilion, um, the use being for classes and group activities organized by the college, um, those groups tend to come through the back road that connects directly to campus, um, which is walkable and bikeable. And so that's really a, a separate use from the CSA operation that's already been in place that, that isn't changing as a result of the pavilion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would like to see, you know, a handicap drop off marked, you know, not just to be welcoming, but to be practical. And you may have students who are, you know, need to come out, you know, in a van or something like that. But I think it'd be nice to maybe do it during, in the flat service just to mark that so people know this is the flat spot to go, you know, to get anywhere. So even though it's not legally required. We can make that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would I would support that, too, uh, partly to keep other people from parking there and obstructing that area and to make it visible to somebody who might be driving in a car and arriving at the spot and not knowing where they should be putting their vehicle to, to start from on an accessible route. Okay, Janet, thank you. And Bruce, you had some comments. Uh, yes, uh, I, I guess I can't. Uh... Help but be interested and curious about the roof, uh, uh, Tom, since you've mentioned that it's uh, asphalt shingles proposed, and then also a little later that uh, it's being set up for PV, uh, perhaps future PV. Um, so uh, it seems to me uh, always odd to put a, a 25 or 30 year surface under a, a 50 year surface, uh, which is to say the PV. Uh, which is going to last much longer than the roof. And is there thought to if if uh, that preparedness for PV would uh, make a metal roof uh, um, a better idea? Funny you mentioned that, Bruce. That's <laughs> where we started, and uh, the budget has dictated our proposed uh, application with an asphalt roof. Okay. Just asking. Yep. Anything else, Bruce? Nope. Okay. Thank you. And Karen, you're next. I just wanted to say um, 
if you're really at this site and you see how pastoral it is and how open, I'm sort of against the uh, mandating any kind of signage. It just seems like such a natural place to come up with somebody handicapped as close to the pavilion. And uh, I, I like to see this space as uncluttered as possible. So I, I don't see the necessity of putting sign up for handicapped parking at all. I think this isn't the place that people are gonna park that much. It's really, it's really a kind of a, a, not a place where there are that many cars people come pick up, students come there and it should be as free of clutter as possible. That's my input. All right, thanks, Karen. Have we got any more comments from the board? All right. Um, maybe we'll go now to public comment. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on this proposal? We are. We have 17 members of the public, uh, and I, at the moment, I don't see any hands. Are, do, would any of you like to make a comment? Okay, no hands there. Um, so Tom, having heard some, some uh, couple of comments in favor of a sign for accessible accommodations for the vehicle and uh, one objection, uh, how do you feel about what you're hearing? I think a, a simple, typical parking sign would would be appropriate if the board would like to propose it as a condition however it was deliberately not included in our application okay all right board members uh it sounds like we may need to get a vote on whether we support a sign like that or not um does anybody want to make any more comments before we I guess have a vote, Bruce. I, I'm uh, swinging towards uh, agreeing with Karen. Um, it is a farm, and uh, and the traffic will always be in the climate weather. So the the stresses on parking and and the the usual uh, concerns that we have are often generated by the fact that parking has to work all year round, but it doesn't here. Um, and uh, it seems to me that it isn't broken and we don't need to fix it. Okay. All right, so why don't I take a take a poll here. Um, so starting with, oh yeah, Andrew, you want to comment? Um, yeah, I mean, you probably would come in and vote. I would like, if this involved like a significant amount of construction or cost, I would agree with that, but it's just a sign. I, my vote would be to put the sign up. All right, so why don't I just consider you in favor of the sign? <laughs> and Bruce, uh, sounds like you are opposed to a sign? Barely. Okay, and uh, Janet, uh, you are in favor? I'm in favor, because I spent years, you know, I driving my mother around with her walker and it's just fantastic to know where to go. And, you know, a lot of times people don't get out and because they're afraid they can't park and things like that. And so I know it's a farm, you know, it's not, you know, but I, I just think it's nice to make the community welcome and make it easier for people who are struggling to with their mobility. Okay. Thank you, Janet. And Karen, we know you are opposed to a sign and that leaves Johanna. <laughs> and it would be have, next we, to the hoop house is that where the sign would go or would it be next yeah, to the get, pavilion just east of that who's hoop house or south maybe it is uh, it'd, just yeah, be, like it'd be a j it'd be adjacent in the most level spot so i think we have three in favor of the sign and two against so you can either make it a tie or or it'll be a clear requirement for the for the one side on the property 
<laughs> sure, let's make it a requirement. I'll be a yes for the sign. All right. Um, if this is an appropriate time, I just want to ask for clarification of what you intend. Is the sign to be designating a spot for accessible parking only, or is it a sign that says no parking here, accessible drop off, keep this area clear? Um, well, I think I think words to, to, to those effects. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll venture that I think most of us were thinking about a. Uh, a sign that said it was an accessible drop-off location yeah. and that others should not be parking there. Yeah. Now, you know, if someone who's in a vehicle and needs to park and it needs an accessible uh, route, you know, maybe they do park there for however long they're on site, but it doesn't need to be signed as an accessible parking space. Thank you. I hope that's helpful. And board members, if I've misconstrued your intent, let me know. Johanna. I think that's right. And then I'd just be curious to hear from Kaylee whether that would screw up operations at all. Okay. Kaylee? I don't think so. I think that, that it sounds like a good idea. I think it would be really fine. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Uh, Janet. I was just going to say it could be a pretty wood sign that looks kind of farmy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I All can right, bet yeah. you it probably is tied into the campus signage program. Sounds good. All right, and and is, if I recall, there was no lighting intended with this uh, pavilion. Is that right, or is there? There's lighting under the roof, and that's all. There's lighting attached to the rafters. They're each only about thirty watts. It's not a very high foot candle level, deliberately by design. And I think that the majority of the year, the building would not be occupied when it comes to sunset to begin with. Right. And so, so, you know, basically all the lighting is shielded by the roof or it's pointing down to start with. So yeah. we don't need to worry too much about dark sky issues. Mm -mm. Not a bit. All right. Uh, Janet. So our bylaw requires the dark sky and that when it lights are off after business hours, unless it's needed for safety. So that would probably be a condition we impose. You're not planning to light it all night? Oh, no. OK. OK. Um, Chris, have we, have we got enough in terms of discussion about this to go ahead and vote? I, I think we've talked about some of the issues that you had put in your email. Um, I'm, I'm surprised about the, the restroom and if, if, but if everybody's fine with that, I'm not going to push that. Um, but certainly as you accumulate activities out there, you know, at some point, somebody's going to say, why isn't there a actual plumbed restroom out there? Um, so when you make a motion, you might want to reference, um, 11.24, just that this complies with the relevant, um, sections of 11.24. All right. Um, I guess we are at the point where we ought to be making a motion. And um, I don't know if anybody in particular wants to make it, but I will venture. I will, let's try, try to put one together here. Um, I guess I would. I would, I would, I will move, I guess, that we approve the site plan review for this project with the one requirement that a sign indicating the accessible drop off location be added to the site uh, adjacent to that flat area. Um, Chris, is that an adequate motion? I think Janet also had a, an, an idea about um, that the lights would go off after business hours. Okay, so in, including a requirement that the lights under the pavilion only be operated during the CSA business hours. Or during now, the farm business hours, during, during whatever activity hours. is happening there. Okay. So do you need the reference to section oh, yeah. 11? Along, along that we find it in compliance with section 
Thank you, Bruce. It, it takes a board to get a motion together. And that you close the public hearing. Oh, good. Yeah, that we okay. That we. <laughs> I guess having a month off, I'm pretty rusty tonight. Yeah. That we that we close the public hearing. All right. So having cobbled that together, Chris, do you think you have enough notes to actually write it out as though it were a coherent motion to start with? Um, that you move to approve the site plan review application with two conditions. One is a requirement that there be a sign for uh, accessible drop-off location, and two, that um, the lights within the pavilion go off after business hours, and that um, this application complies with the relevant sections of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw and that you close the public hearing. That sounds good to me. Board members, any other comments before we go through our vote? Um, I was going to second the motion. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, Janet seconds. It's official. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead, Bruce? Are you on in favor of that motion? I am. All right, and Andrew. Aye. And I'm an aye as well, Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And Karen. Aye. Okay. The motion passes. We can close that public hearing. The time is 7.23, and we thank you, Tom, and your team, and Kayla from thank you. Amherst. Uh, good luck with the project. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you very much. Be well. OK, so now let's see. It's 7.24, and seems a little early to have our 8 o'clock break, but I know the next topic may take a little while. So we'll go ahead and start, and then we'll try to take a break at around 8 or maybe a little after 8. So time now is 7.24, and we'll go ahead and continue a, a public hearing on a zoning amendment. The, it's regarding zoning bylaw, Article 3, use regulations, and Article 4, development methods, Article 9, non-conforming lots, uses and structures, and Article 12, definitions. This is continued from March 1st, uh, 2023 and April 5th, 2023. To see if the town will vote to amend Article 3 use regulations to change the permitting requirements for owner occupied, occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes, non-owner occupied duplexes, converted dwellings and townhouses to create more streamlined permitting pathways for these uses to remove the use category subdividable dwellings, to add a use category three family detached dwelling or triplex, to add a permitting pathway and standards and conditions for triplexes, to modify standards and conditions for other housing use categories, to amend permitting requirements for housing use categories in the aquifer recharge protection overlay district, to amend Article 4, Development Methods, to add three-family dwelling, where appropriate. To amend Article 9, Non-conforming Lots, Uses and Structures, to add a reference to three-family dwelling. And to amend Article 12, Definitions, to add three-family detached dwelling unit, or triplex, and to delete subdividable dwelling. As I said, this hearing is continued from two dates earlier this spring. All right, um, looks like we've got Pat and Mandy back with us. And Chris, I know you've been in consultation with them and you have a document that you released shortly before our meeting this evening. Um, let's see, Chris, do you, do you want to start or do you wanna have Mandy and Pat go first? I think Mandy and Pat should go first, and then I'm happy to go through what I think are the changes that I wanted you to um, be aware of. It was a little hard to um, sort of separate out what was different from the March 1st uh, version that you saw. So that was 
most of what I was trying to do with my memo was to make it clear what was changed since March 1st. So why don't you let Mandy and Pat go first and then I'll pick up when they're finished. Okay, thank you. All right, welcome Mandy, Joe and Pat. Thank you, and I'm gonna be asking Mandy Joe to go first. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank Chris and Nate and Rob for speaking with us multiple times and working with us. We have actually, I believe here, the latest revision is generally supported by the planning staff, except for one area, which I know Chris will talk about what she would like to see there and we're going to talk about what we would like to see there and what's in the proposal but when you're looking at this draft which is revision 11 um the stuff in highlight in highlighted yellow is a change from the draft that was at the original hearing um so that's that's also indicate that's also things that were in the april 5th um packet and then you know so if it's in yellow it's a change from what was presented in early march if it's in blue, it's also a change, but it's a change since the last revision that was in the April 5th packet. Um, so, so the only thing that changed between April 5th's packet and today's packet is what's highlighted in that aqua color. Um, all the other stuff in yellow was presented in the April 5th packet that I know there wasn't a hearing for. And so we've basically reached agreement. It's the in indication in that teal color where Pat and I, um, haven't been able to reach an agreement with Chris and uh, the staff. And so we're basically presenting you two options and we'd like to hear the thoughts between what Chris would like to see and what we would like to see on that. But basically we've brought back our proposal um, from the, the wide ranging scope that it was in early March. You'll see that um, in non-owner occupied duplexes, um, we have reverted to um, basically no changes to the permitting pathway back to special permits, except we're removing the no in the aquifer recharge protection district. So that change is still there. That would allow duplexes in aquifer recharge protection districts, but on, under a special permit. But other than that, that, that item is highlighted, but it wouldn't actually be a change to the bylaw other than that deletion of the no in parentheses. So we're back to the current zoning for most of non-owner occupied duplexes. Um, for triplexes, uh, this is a new category, so everything's new, but we've actually changed in all of the residential and the business air, the business neighborhood area to special permit, except in the RO and RLD, we're proposing no triplexes. Um, so that's a change from, I believe we were originally at site plan review. So we've, we've moved back towards a special permit in those areas. Um, the change, and, and then I'll go through the condition changes, but I thought I'd start with the permit pathway changes in townhouse um we've actually there's only now two proposed changes to the current zoning in town townhouses we have changed we have proposed a lot more changes um and so what we've reverted to all those yellows are reverse reverting to the current zoning so we're actually all of that yellow that changed from the last um proposal to this one is going back to essentially not proposing a change. Um, and so in townhouses, the only changes we're now proposing are in the RN to allow townhouses um, by special permit, which matches the current zoning in RVC and RG, and in the BG to actually move from site plan review to special permit, which would match the apartment zoning that we just changed about a year and a half ago in the BG area. Um, that is a summary of the changes to the permitting pathways. Um, since the proposal from March, we have added at the request of um, the planning staff in the general duplex and triplex categories and conditions and standards, a requirement for design guidelines that would be adopted by the permit granting board. Um, and so the planning board and the ZBA would be able to adopt design standards for duplexes and triplexes um, regarding the things that are in there. This is a language that the planning staff provided. Um, and then the written decision was moved up into the general categories. That was already there in many of the conditions for duplexes and triplexes. It just moved up into applicable to all. Um, 
owner occupied duplexes. The, the only change, and this is where um, the planning staff and Pat and I, um, we haven't been able to reach a, an agreement on what the language should be. Um, and that's in this teal. And we are proposing, so, so there's, what we have found out from these conversations is that in Amherst, multiple buildings and principal uses are allowed on a single property. And Pat and I, in proposing these changes, really wanted to make duplexes, particularly owner-occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes by right with just a building permit, so the yes. But when we were proposing that, our thinking was one building on a land, one building on a parcel, that building should be by right. And so we, in our zoning, allow multiple buildings on parcels. And so what the teal language basically does is say, when, when plot in conjunction with the permitting pathway above of yes, um, says in these zones, the first building up to two dwelling units, essentially if it's the first new building, um, is a by right yes. But once you get above that, we're basically, Pat and I are proposing that the permit pathway remain basically what it is now. Um, not quite exactly what it is now, but right now, without any changes to the zoning, um, in the RG RVC, you're allowed to build as many duplexes as you want on a parcel as a special, as with site plan review. And in the RN, RO, and RLD, you do it by special permit. We are proposing that once you get over one building or essentially two dwelling units, that you need a site plan review, just like you would right now in the RG, RVC, and RN, although the RN goes from special permit to that site plan review, because um, right now it's a special permit. And in the RO and RLD, our low density districts, that you would need that special permit if you want to put more than two dwelling units on that property. Uh, we believe it meets that that proposal meets our goals of um, removing single family only by right yeses, exclusive use of yeses for single family only zones from our bylaws. It gets us to having a yes for duplexes, but recognizes that that's, that yes is appropriate for one building, not for two, three, four, six buildings on a parcel. Um, and that once you get above that one building, we should keep the current zoning in place, which is site plan review or special permit, basically. Um, so that's the condition. Chris is gonna talk about what her proposal is for that particular teal section. Um, Non-owner occupied duplexes, the only change from the previous one was in reverting back to special permit. You revert back to the section of the bylaw that refers to special permits, not site plan reviews. So that's why that's highlighted. It originally had a section 1124, I think in it. Affordable duplexes is the same, the addition is the same teal. Um, and similar things, affordable duplexes, the first building we want as a yes, that's one of the goals we started with in making this proposal. But after that, given the concerns of the planning department and our recognition and our goals, um, the second, essentially the second building, if it's dwelling units and duplexes and beyond in duplexes um, would be, special site plan review for RVC, RG, and RN, which would actually match the current zoning that we have in those areas, and special permit for the RO, RLD, which would actually be stricter than the zoning we currently have in those areas for if we don't change the bylaw at all, what your, what your permitting pathway would be to build two, three, four, five duplexes on a parcel. Um, the triplex change is just that reference to the section to correct that when going back to special permit from site plan review. The biggest change in conditions um, is in the converted dwellings. And the goal of these changes, which has been supported by the planning staff, um, is to bring converted dwellings. First of all, it was a very complicated thing. You'll see section five is proposed to be removed. A new section four is added. A couple of other conditions are added. Section, the current section, I think it's the current section five is quite confusing when you read it. And it talks about percentages of adding and you can get extra additions and things like that. Um, in, in our discussions with the planning staff, we really said we want 
what a, what people think of a converted dwelling and what we think of it is is converting a current building to from if it's got one family in it from one to two or if it's a garage from a garage to a single unit or something like that but dealing with the building that's already on the parcel and so the goal with the changes to these conditions is to basically bring converted dwellings back to that of you're converting an existing building and that's what you're doing with conversion. If you're looking to add on to an existing building an extensive amount of extra structure, well, you're no longer in converted building or a converted dwelling. You're now in a new development, a duplex or a triplex. And so the bulk of these changes are to bring it back, make it a little more comprehensible, a little more easy to follow, um, more standard and all of that these these were the this is the language that was requested when we talked about that by the planning staff um and the building commissioner so that's why that's there and with that that is all of the changes from here as i said the chris and nate and rob we thank them so much for all the work they've done with us and talking to us uh we were able to get this proposal to something that other than those questions about the permitting of more than two dwelling units, uh, two dwelling units for duplexes on a parcel. Um, other than that, we basically are in agreement with this proposal. And I'll I'll let Pat say anything if she wants to. And otherwise, I think it's off to Chris to explain her request on that language. No, you did a great job, and I like being quiet. <laughs> okay, Pat. Thank you, and thank you, Mandy Jo. Chris, you want to? Yeah, hi. Um, so I provided a memo to the planning board um, highlighting the changes that Mandy Jo has just described. Um, it's it's kind of hard to listen to it, and it's probably easier to go through it one by one. And what I would suggest is that the planning board take the copy of the um, the. Uh, proposal that they received in their March 1st packet and compare that to the proposal that they received in tonight's packet and then follow along with the changes that I've listed in the memo. And that should help you to understand, you know, each one of the changes, or at least maybe not understand it, but at least know what it is. Um, it's kind of hard for me and others to look at a proposal and kind of try to figure out what does blue mean, what does yellow mean, what does red mean, and all of that. So anyway, I'm just offering you this, um, my rendition of what has changed since March 1st. I'm not, I hope it's helpful. Um, but the second part is that um, we have recently, and I would say in the last few years, um, had instances where we've allowed, um, and if you're looking for the page reference, Pam, uh, it's the bottom of page three, um, <clears throat> where we've allowed um, more than one principal use on a property. And I can give you examples of that. Um, at 32 North Prospect Street, it is at the bottom. Yeah, there you go. Um, at 32 North Prospect Street, the Zoning Board of Appeals allowed um, one single, um, single family home to be converted to a duplex and at the same time add four townhouses to that property. And it turned out to be a very nice development and it fits well in the neighborhood, but it was um, you know, really clearly scrutinized by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Another one is 1147 North Pleasant Street, which is Michael Holden's property up in North Amherst. And um, what he did was he had an existing duplex and with his growing family, he wanted to add a single family house to the rear of the property. And the planning board actually did um, look at this project and make a recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the Zoning Board of Appeals eventually approved what was proposed. Um, and they did make a finding that um, adding the single family house to the property with the duplex was uh, complementary, that they were complementary uses. So the zoning board also made that same finding for 32 North Prospect Street. And then on uh, 164, 174 Sunset Avenue, which is one that people are more familiar with since it happened fairly recently, there were um, 
two different types of buildings. One was a non-owner occupied duplex and the other was a three family or excuse me a three three apartment buildings and three non-owner occupied duplexes and the zoning board of appeals made the finding that those two types of uses those two use categories could exist on that property and they would be complementary let's see i think there was one other example uh, maybe not for the zoning board of appeals but there was one other example where the planning board made a similar determination um, Boltwood Place, which is that uh, building that some people call the ice box behind G old Judy's. Um, I actually think it's a nice looking building, but in any event, um, that building was uh, proposed as a mixed use building um, on the same parcel as Judy's restaurant and the planning board um, as part of site plan review made the determination or the finding that um, those two uses were complementary. Um, now this was um, in the downtown area where density is expected. It was in the PG general business zoning district. So the planning board made that uh, determination through site plan review. Um, the, the concern that we have in the planning department is that there could be a proliferation of um, different use categories on a single parcel without benefit of, of a special permit review. And a special permit allows the permit granting authority to deny the application if it believes that it is inappropriate for the location or that it doesn't meet some of the other criteria listed in section 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. The other thing that a special permit does is it allows um, the abutters to appeal a decision. So those are two things that make a special permit different from site plan review. Site plan review is basically saying, we welcome this use in this particular location, and we think that the only thing we need to do is help you to figure out how many parking spaces you need and how the site should be lit and um, you know how it should be landscaped, et cetera. But we welcome the use in this particular location. And I think the planning department feels that allowing multiple um, buildings on a site um, is something that really needs to be scrutinized carefully. So we have proposed um, different language from the language proposed by Mandy Joe and, and Pat. Um, they, Mandy Joe and Pat have seen this language previously um, and they, they decided to go with, with different language. But in any event, um, our language for owner-occupied duplexes would say in the RG, RVC and RN districts, any development with more than two, but not more than four dwelling units on a single parcel would require site plan review. So in other words, you could have the first duplex by yes, which is, we agree that that's okay. Um, but the second duplex would require site plan review. Um, however, in the RG, RVC and RN district, any development that has more than four dwelling units or more than two duplexes on a single parcel would require a special permit. And we think that's important because, um, you know, it, it really, there is an expectation of what, um, what zoning is going to do in, in your neighborhood and you should not have um, the opportunity to be completely surprised by having something that is very different from what your expectation is. So a special permit really allows careful scrutiny by the zoning board. It allows the zoning board to say no, and it allows um, neighbors to appeal if, if something seems amiss. Um, so let's see, um, you wanna scroll on down, Pam? Um, oh, okay, so you can stop there. In the RO and RLD districts, any development with more than two dwelling units on a single parcel would require a special permit. And we think that's reasonable. Um, and then for affordable duplexes, we're saying basically the same thing, that we don't, that we think that it is necessary to have some pretty clear control over how many units can be on a parcel. There could be um, you know, a development, say you wanted to develop uh, under the proposal that is being put forth by the proponents, you could have a situation where you have um, affordable duplexes and you could have any number of them on a parcel as long as you met the, um, 
the dimensional requirements. You could have any number of them on the parcel by site plan review. And the planning board usually doesn't deny an application as long as the application meets the dimensional requirements um, and meets the other criteria of the zoning bylaw, it usually grants the permit. It's very rare for the planning board to deny a permit. And usually that would be because the applicant hadn't provided the information that was necessary or was clearly in violation of some particular um, requirement of the zoning bylaw. So we really feel that in order to control the number of units, even though we all love affordable units and we all want to have more of them, we're just concerned that we don't run a proliferation of more than um, an appropriate number of units on a on a property and and Mandy Jo has brought up the issue that um, well it's already allowed in some districts by site plan review well I think that's an unintended consequence of a, a decision that was made a long time ago to allow owner occupied duplexes by site plan review rather than special permit in certain districts um, I don't say that decision was um, misguided but what is what was unknown or an unintended consequence is that later on, years later, um, there would be a new interpretation of the zoning bylaw, which would allow um, multiple uses on a property um, if they were uh, determined to be complementary. So it's kind of, um, it's a correction now that we know that we can have more than one building or one use category on a property. This is a, an attempt to correct the idea that then you could have any number of dwelling units on a property as long as you had site plan review. So I guess that's all I have to say for now, but our recommendation is that you, you know, have your discussion and you hear from the public and then take a chance to um, review this memo so that you really understand what the changes are from March 1st. And I must say, uh, along with Mandy and Pat, that it was um, it was a good process that we went through and we did uh, resolve many of our issues. And I think this is the lingering issue that we have, but that you don't um, make a decision tonight to um, you know, recommend or not recommend this proposal, but that you think about it and come back and continue your public hearing. Come back maybe May 3rd or May 17th, whenever you feel that you will be ready to uh, vote on this, because this is an important um, proposal. It's an important change in our zoning bylaw. It will really allow more dwelling units to be built in town, and that's a good thing, but we want to be able to control them and um, control where they go carefully. So that's that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, board members, does anybody have questions they want to ask this evening? Um, as as Chris mentioned, I think I'm hoping that we will continue this meeting to a date in May and uh, during that, you know, in, in between, we'll, we'll each have a chance to sit down with uh, all the documents and review this on our own. Andrew. Um, I did, if you don't mind, Doug, I did have a question about the design standards in section 3.321. Do you mind if I just ask that? Sure. Um, sure. Which is, it, you know, it mentions if, yeah, I'll say this. I think, you know, feedback we've heard from letters that are been written in and things that we've talked about here as well is that we want to make sure we have design standards in place. There's a great interest in having design standards in place. And just the language here, it, it just, it, it makes it seem like this is premature. So if we come up with the rules, we'll apply them. Why not wait to see if we come up with the rules first and then have language that's definitive, right? So. Have says you know if adopted in rules and regulations of the permit granting board, they shall be applied. Why don't we let that process play itself out and then modify the language based on outcomes of that? Okay, Andrew. Um, you know my suspicion is that this is an attempt to avoid having to go back and change the language later, and just save a you know sort of procedural 
another round of procedural things, but I, uh, Mandy Jo or Chris or Pat, does anybody, any of you want to give your opinion and you know better why this was put in this way? Uh, shall I call on you, Mandy Jo? I, uh, I think Chris might have a better answer than I or Pat too. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll, we'll turn to Chris. So right now we have um, a reference to design standards that are in the uh, design review section of the bylaw. Um, those standards really relate more to either a downtown or a village center than they do to um, you know, rural or semi-rural residential development. And so we think it's important if we're going to have a lot of um, multi-family, two-family, three-family <clears throat> townhouses, whatever, um, <clears throat> that there be some design standards, particularly with regard to two-family. So right now, two-family houses need to adhere to, um, or, or the board who reviews them um, is, is asked to look at the design standards that the design review board looks at. We're saying you need to come up with design standards that really relate more to uh, residential dwellings than downtown. And um, so we intend to uh, get those design standards on the books, but we don't have them yet. And so it would, it would involve the planning board and the zoning board of appeals coming up with design standards, and hopefully they'd come up with the same because we would work with both groups. Um, part of the reason for putting this in is because um, in some cases we might face a situation where the building commissioner was um, involved with um, approving things. I guess not in the case of two, yeah, in the case of two family, if we're saying two family dwellings are a yes in all districts, then who approves them? The building commissioner approves them. So we wanted to give the building commissioner some um, guidance as far as what kinds of design standards he could look at and discuss with an applicant and not have the applicant say, well, you don't have any authority to talk about the design of this building with me. Um, so this would give the uh, building commissioner as well as the um, as well as the planning board and the zoning board of appeals, the ability to use these design standards. So we think it's an important addition. Uh, the fact that we don't have these written right now, um, you know, we're saying, well, we'll write them soon. Um, and we don't think that's a um, fatal flaw in this proposal. So I guess that's that's all I have to say about that. I, I guess if we, and thank you for the, the clarification. I guess if we think we're gonna write it soon, then why not wait, right? To me, the, again, the way it's written, it seems like there is now, there'll be an open window where you know this goes into effect, things can happen without having design standards in place. Um, again, if we think it's going to happen soon, I would I would say let's let that happen, and then we can have some very clear language in the the the, the zoning. Because otherwise, I mean, this might exist for the next fifteen or twenty years, right? With that same language in place, um, seems like an opportunity to address concerns we're getting from citizens, as well as have language that's that's clean and concise. So um, that would be my proposal or my recommendation is that. We don't. Uh, we we wouldn't use language like that, and we would prioritize the design standards so that we could have this be clean. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Chris, did you want to say anything else? I think um, part of this was a response to uh, Mandy, Joe, and Pat um, thinking that duplexes, particularly owner-occupied duplexes, should be treated um, in a way that's similar to single-family homes and that um, they didn't think that design standards would necessarily be appropriate because single family homes aren't required to adhere to any design standards. And so, but we felt that it, that we in the planning department felt that it was important. So this is how we arrived at um, a compromise that we would come up with design standards that were suitable for two family homes. And uh, so this is what we came up with, but we don't have them written now, so. That's it. 
And am I right that the town council would have to uh, adopt those if they were drafted by? The town council would not have to adopt them. The planning board and the zoning board of appeals would adopt them because they would be embedded in the rules and regulations rather than in um, zoning. Okay. All right. So at the moment, the way it's written, we on the board could adopt some standards and implement them kind of over the objection, it sounds like, of Mandy Joe and Pat, who really didn't want standards to be part of the process of doing a duplex as of right. Is that accurate? I think that's accurate, but they okay. can speak for themselves. Right. I, I'm not, you know, I just want to be sure I understand it. Mandy Jo, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I would say it's not quite accurate because what we're presenting here includes this ability, right? And so while, um, yes, our initial proposal indicated we had removed design standards for specific reasons, particularly that single family homes don't have them and we would like particularly owner occupied and affordable duplexes to be treated similarly to single family homes. Through our conversations with the planning staff and the building commissioner, as you see, we have added this language in. So I, I don't think it's accurate anymore to say over objection. Okay. Um, um, you know, we have put this language in as a compromise. We have worked really hard to get to a compromise proposal and a proposal that both Pat and I and the planning staff and building commissioner could get behind. And as I said, the only thing that we haven't quite been able to reach an agreement on is that one part that's in teal in the two sections where okay. Pat and I wanted to just hear what the planning board thought on those sections. All right, thank you. Uh, Bruce, you wanna go next? Uh, yes, I, I, I will. I've got a couple of things, uh, Doug. Uh, uh, the first, I think, I, I generally agree with Andrew. Um, I, I, I think that uh, on the subject of design standards, and I know I'm, I imagine Hilda will have something to say on this as well, so uh, we can look forward to that. Uh, because I read her piece, and I think she's got some uh, interesting uh, experience here. But it seems to me that as we are moving towards increasing the density uh, in some of these older parts of towns, uh, particularly that uh, having design standards is a good idea. And whether it starts with duplexes or, tri uh, or triplexes, uh, or even if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's brought in to give some guidance and assistance to a single family, I don't know. But some, some kind of assistance as we increase density uh, by having some design standards, I think is a good idea. And, and I would say its reference in here is probably a, a, a good as a, as a kind of a, um, a driver or, or providing impetus for us to do that. Um, as I say, I agree with Andrew that, that it makes sense to me that we would do those first and then we would adopt this or uh, whatever form of this. Um, it seems to me that this, this whole uh, uh, set of proposals on January ch zoning changes is we, we should expect should take some time. Uh, I think Manny Joe a month ago said that, or mentioned that the, the rental bylaw revision has taken a year, and, and this seems to be vastly more complicated than that. Although I can't say I've studied the, you know, I haven't, I haven't attended the CRC meetings on that. So, but still, this is complicated. And so we should expect that this might take some time. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is more actually on that uh, is that this is a very wide ranging, broad, sweeping uh, set of proposals that involves um, three or four uh, residential types over, I don't know, six or eight or 10 um, zoning districts. And so you, you get a cell or a, a, a matrix of uh, 30 plus or minus uh, um, individual cases. And I'm just finding that this is impossible for us to consider these, this whole package simultaneously. I think it, it, it's just beyond, um, it's beyond my abilities to do this intelligently. Um, 
when we meet once every couple of weeks, um, usually not even face to face. Um, so I would suggest that as we move forward, that we um, consider uh, breaking this up. And so, for example, considering duplexes and triplexes, um, maybe in certain zones, but certainly doing the duplex triplex uh, consideration, doing that, completing that, and then moving on, say, to the townhouse. Similarly, maybe in sequences across in certain uh, bundles of zoning districts, as opposed to all of them at once. And then finally, the more complex of the three, the uh, converted dwelling. And if we were to be able to focus quite uh, uh, into a, 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 a series of, I don't know, six or eight uh, topics, um, dispatch one before we begin another, we can register that some of the conversation in, in, the, in, in parcel, or at least uh, um, topic area one might it relative might usefully inform something future in townhouses and we can create and make a note to make sure we don't forget to bring that up at the appropriate time but from my point of view i think then i could actually imagine coming to some sort of useful conclusion on this but otherwise i'm just going to be asking for continuations ad nauseum Okay, thanks, Bruce. Mandy Joe, I saw your hand go up during that. I, I'm going to call on you before we get to Janet. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, the, the issue of adopting design guidelines through rules and regulations before a zoning bylaw is amended, um, I, would, I would caution that. Um, the boards are only allowed to adopt rules and regulations as enabled by legislation, whether that be state legislation or zoning bylaw legislation, and it can only be adopted within the scope of the enabling legislation. And I don't know whether design guidelines right now are enabled under any legislation to be adopted by rules and regs. And so unless this amendment is adopted or until such amendment is adopted, the permit granting authorities may not legally be able to adopt design guidelines through rules and regulations. And so the revision that enables the adoption through rules and regulations legally might have to happen before any rules and regulations that include design guidelines are actually adopted. Okay, thanks. It sounds like that's that's what you think is the case. Um, so we're not really sure. Um, but it also sounds like if we really wanted to have them in place, essentially simultaneously, um, you know, we could get them all ready to go. And, you know, five minutes after the zoning was approved, we could adopt the uh, the design guidelines which you know since so okay all right uh, Janet you're you're the re remaining hand at the moment thank you um I appreciate the changes in the amount of work this is taking I I, I want to echo like everybody's comment so far is I actually feel really lost and so when we're talking about the design guidelines, when I looked at the first page of the most recent revision, I thought that all duplexes and triplexes had to follow the design guidelines in 3.204. And so there wouldn't be any difference regardless of who's occupying or not occupying. And so that just is completely unclear to me why that extra, like why we're waiting to adopt design guidelines. I, I just, so I'm lost there. But I also know that the master plan says like at least 16 times that we should adopt design guidelines first before increasing density. And a lot of um, what happens in this zoning amendment is an increase in density in the RN, the RO and the RLD and the RG. And so 
I think we just have to bite the bullet and adopt some design guidelines. And I think they should be uniform across all multifamily housing. I'm happy to throw single family housing into that. I would adopt the guidelines in 3.204 um, and just had them applied by anybody. So that's, you know, that, so that's my first comment. Um, but I'm, I'm just, I'm in a struggle to understand this, the, the changes on the changes, but also, you know, this creates a triplex and we already have triplexes in the bylaw. They could be converted dwellings or it could be a subdividable dwellings. And both the converted dwellings and subdividable dwellings add extra conditions that get stri stripped away for triplexes um, in, the, in here. And then you could have a converted dwelling that's a triplex and it's gonna have different conditions than the triplex that you've created. And then, you know, you can have a triplex. I mean, it's just really confusing to me. Like we're adding triplexes we're, you know, it's like you go into different zoning districts and different types of housing and multi-using, and they're all sort of treated differently. And I, I'm struggling to explain it. And I can sort of sit down and say you're increasing, you know, but I don't know how to take this all as a piece. So if we have a triplex that's a converted dwelling, it's going to be different than a triplex that's built as a triplex. And for some reason, we've dumped some dividable dwellings, which are triplexes, and are permitted in certain districts and not. And then also we're changing where they can go or what permit they go. And I have no idea why. So I don't know how to, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Bruce camp of like, I don't know how to approach this. Um, you know, I could write a long thing about all these different things I see, but I don't know how we talk about it in a meeting that hopefully does go on for 17 hours. And then also this is a public hearing and it's for the public to understand the zoning amendment and to respond to it. And so my, I feel like if I'm struggling and Bruce is struggling, and I assume other people might be struggling, I don't know how the members of the public would ever kind of grasp this. Um, and so, you know, I, and so basically I'm just, I'm just struggling. Um, I don't understand why there's increases in density in this bylaw in the RO, the RLD, the RG and RN. And do we want that? Like, what is the density increase? What does it look like on the ground? And do we want that? Um, and we need to know what those numbers are and why they happen. And then, you know, if we telescope back and just say the framework is that your goal for the zoning amendments, which is incredibly laudable, which is to increase housing for low and middle income people, year round residents is probably not going to happen because we know that most of the new housing in Amherst has either been extremely at the high end or it's student housing, which is also at the high end or very high rental prices. And the people who can afford to build or convert or add by build a triplex are gonna be probably wealthy developers who are looking to maximize their investments. And so, um, you know, so I just, I just think we're not gonna get there. And that, that was kind of the conclusion or the thoughts of a lot of people at the last meeting. And I still don't see how this very complicated series of changes, which are extremely difficult to understand. And we're not able to talk like about, I would love to track converted dwellings. I'd like to talk about subdividable dwellings. I'd like to talk about what happens in the RO and RLD, why some density is allowed in one form of a building, but not, um, or previously you weren't allowed to build it and now you can. But I also just, um, I don't think we're going to, you know, we can spend weeks and years on this, but will we achieve the goal of more housing for low and middle income people, like for just regular folk? And the answer is probably no, because we have this huge, intense student demand, and that's not being addressed. And there might be ways to limit the new housing, say 50% of the occupancy is, has to be non-students. Um, you know, there might be ways to limit that, but they're not here. And without them being here, there's no there's no real controls. I will stop talking. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you Mandy, uh, your hand went up again. Yeah, um, triplexes. Right now they're permitted currently under the current zoning under townhouses and apartments, and I guess converted dwellings can be converted to a three family building. So they're currently under three different depending on how you look at it, three different uses with three different sets of conditions, as Janet said. Our proposal 
creates a new triplex category, which removes triplexes from the townhouse and apartments and adds a new use category. And under the converted dwelling category, which you know can still create a three family or a four family or in some business areas, a six family up to a six family, it actually changes to require the conditions under whichever use it's going to end up most closely related to. So if it's going to go to a three family, it would require under our proposal that all of the conditions under the triplex use be enforced under the converted dwelling. So in actuality, our proposal combines and makes more uniform the conditions required for all three families um, and all two families, because it would require under conversion from a single family to a two family, even though the use category is under converted dwelling, the conditions required under the proposal we've made would require that all of the conditions of duplex be followed. And so we're trying to make it so that all three family buildings in town have the same conditions. Um, all owner non-owner occupied duplexes, no matter whether done through a converted dwelling or the non-owner occupied duplex use category have the same conditions. So I, I just wanted to indicate that to clear up that confusion. Thank you, Mandy Jo. Um, Karen, you were the next hand. Could I so, respond to that? I'm sorry, Janet. So could I respond to that? Because to talk about, to stay on one topic for a bit about this. So in converted dwellings and subdividable dwellings, there's all sorts of extra conditions that are stripped away by moving them into triplex. And why? And so do we know what we've lost by moving, you know, a converted dwelling or a subdividable dwelling, which is a triplex, We've taken away all sorts of extra conditions, um, you know, the, you know, like in terms of changes to exterior, the limits of, you know, additional um, extra square footage per per extra unit. Um, you know, it has to be on a, you know, a busy way or I mean, there's all these different things. And, you know, there's pay, there's lines and lines of x out conditions that would be attached or limits be attached to subdividable dwellings and converted dwellings. And okay. so there's a huge loss there. So, okay, that's the question. So first of all, we're proposing an elimination of subdividable dwellings as a use category completely at the request of the building commissioner. Um, so that would not be a category anymore. Um, as for converted dwellings, Yes, there are some conditions. I think you're talking about this condition five about involved demolition and removal of an existing structure that's currently there that is newly um, proposed for removal. Is that correct, Janet? Is that the one you're referencing? Well, there's pages, there's like two pages of conditions. And then why are we getting rid of subdividable dwellings just because the building commissioner said? I mean, that that's what I'm saying is that the level of conversation needs to take place with the board do we want to get rid of the restrictions and the limits on these two types of multifamily housing? Um, well, that that'll certainly be part of the, you know, the deliberation that each of us will have as we review this. So, you know, if there's things in this proposal that you object to, that you know, they'll have to be balanced against maybe there's some other things that you like. So, at the moment, we have to consider it as a whole. But do we understand it? Well, I guess we'll all find out as we get as we dive into it. I mean, you know, to the extent we do, we understand our own zoning bylaw already. I mean, you know, this isn't doesn't seem all that more, more complicated than what we've already got. Well, let's go through converted dwellings. You, a resident manager or owner occupied heavily track. You have to be in a heavily trafficked street close to businesses. Um, it's just there's paid there's like two pages of conditions and, let, well, can and, we, and they're can clearly we, proposing that those those be eliminated and that we follow the if it's a triplex that's being converted then we follow the rules in the triplex and so that's a change yes and so do we understand that does the public understand it do the board members do we agree with that 
isn't that the discussion that we need to know in depth? And and also it depends. Well, we're, we're just opening the conversation tonight. I mean, I'm I'm not prepared to say I understand every bit of this yet. Okay. Karen. So. And actually, I, after, after Karen, we're going to take our eight o'clock break. Okay. I mean, this this almost seems to me watching from like it could be a Saturday Night Live skit <laughs> because I totally agree with Bruce. In order to go forward, we have to take this one thing at a time. Uh, Mandy, you impress me with your intelligence, how you're bringing this and that, but I can't follow that. I can't go from this to that, to that, to that, that like that. Even studying it for hours, I. It's, it's too complex, it's too broad to make progress, take one thing and discuss that, the changes and stick with that in these residence uh, areas that are also broad. Uh, then we can move forward incrementally. Otherwise, I agree with Bruce, I'm just gonna keep moving it down the line because it's, uh, it's like a algebra 204 to and it with many consequences. So um, that that's my proposal. Okay, thanks, Karen. All right, so that was the last hand from the board. Um, we will we will take a five minute break now. I'm seeing that the clock says 818. So if you can all turn off your camera, mute yourself, and come back at 823, we will resume the conversation. Um, and most likely go to public comment. So those members of the public that are uh, attending and wanna make a comment about this topic, uh, be ready with your comments when we return. Thank you.
Okay, board members. If any of you are waiting behind your dark screen to come on back and let us know that you're here. Time is 8.23 and we can resume the meeting when everybody's back. At the moment, I only see Pam Field Sadler. I do see Chris now, okay. Okay, I see Karen, I see Bruce. And Bruce, I see your hand up. So I just wanted to make a short statement before the public uh, hearing. Okay. I let's wanted wait, to let's wait for Andrew and then yeah, then we'll resume after I tell you what time it is when we resume. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Okay, Andrew, you're back. All right. You got you got yourself a snack i can see okay uh Ms. So mr time... marshall do you know um i just want to recognize that johanna newman is not with us yes i did notice that um but i can't remember at what time i noticed okay yeah so we'll probably have to go back to the recording and find that mm -hmm. thank you for pointing that out sure Okay, so the time is 825 and uh, I see everybody back. Uh, so Bruce, you wanted to say something? Yes, just briefly. Uh, I mean, I think some people might be thinking, uh, why is the board giving so much time to a uh, proposal from essentially two private citizens? Uh, it, Mandy, Joe and Pat have been clear that it's not coming from the CRC, it's coming from them. And, uh, and why is the planning board uh, uh, committing so much time to two public citizens. Well, my answer to that, to folks who've raised with me, has been uh, is two people who put in a tremendous amount of work, and I think it deserves our reflection. Um, and finally, I'm reminded perhaps of the most heroic example of this in my experience in town is Peter Kitchell, who pretty much drove the parking garage through town meeting all by himself I mean initially so this is not without precedent is what I'm saying and, and I think it might be helpful for folks who are wondering whether there's some special uh, uh, dispensation that's given to councillors to free range I, I'm choosing not to consider that at all I, I'm, I'm looking at two people who have uh, decided to put a great deal of time and effort into this and I'm thinking we've got another Peter Kitchell Okay, thanks, Bruce. Pat, I see your hand. Yeah, I just have a very short statement to make. Uh, there is a housing crisis and in Amherst, and that's part of what's driving it. And we're looking, you're, you're the planning board, and you're throwing your hands up about zoning that is incredibly complicated. And I think what Mandy Joe has done and is doing um, and and and, and really express is trying to simplify and um, level the system in some way. Infill development is critically important to address the housing crisis. Capitalism is its own problem. And unless we have rent control and things like that, you know, more power to Michelle Wu, uh, we, we have real problems in this town. What I see is a lot of fear and not just in this group, but in terms of the community at large. And I really, really want us to take some risks to address issues of need for housing in this town. And, and do, you know, that's enough for now. 
Okay, thank you, Pat. All right, um, Janet, do you absolutely need to say this, whatever it is, before we have some public comment? I kind of do. Um, first of all, I'm not afraid of change and I don't have any fear. Um, but I, I do think we need to talk as a board about how we go forward and what's our plan to how to address this very complicated proposal. And so, and for our own sakes and for the sake of our recommendation and also just help the public understand it too, or to dig into it. So I'm not sure what the next, forward, but I, that's just seems like we're, I need to see where we're going or how we're gonna do it. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. All right, at this point, we have 14 members of the public that are attending, and I'm ready for public comment from them. So uh, please put okay. your hand up if you would like to make a comment. So far, I see three hands. Pam, interestingly enough, your timer is has a mirror image. No! <laughs> Oh. I don't know how you did that. Time's up, Pam. Uh, <laughs> I, th I, I think we can we can keep track of it that way, but uh, are you sure? Quite a trick. I don't know how you did that. So I see four hands from the public. And uh, if there are others that would mm -hmm. like to put their hand up, um, I'm interested to know if all you know 14 of you want to make a comment or if there's really only four of you, and at this point, we're up to six, seven. And the more, you know, I think uh, maybe we'll start with two minutes rather than three minutes, Pam, if you can uh, put up two minutes rather mm -hmm. than three on your timer. Great. Okay, okay we'll start with Hilda Greenhouse, Greenbaum. Uh, Come on over and give us your name and your your address, and please keep your comments to two minutes. If if we get through this pretty quickly, we can come back and have some more comments from the public. But I'd like to start with uh, two minutes. And I think Pam's going to bring you over. Yeah. There she is. Hello. Okay. Pam. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, I want to really thank the planning board for all of the time they're putting into this because this project is taking a considerable amount of time from very busy, very intelligent people. And I really appreciate being heard. And, and I, I, I mentioned Bruce and I mentioned Andrew particularly for having read my memo and understood what I was saying. Um, a very quick note that you need to be aware of is that there is, does not seem to be, from my experience, any market for these owner-occupied duplexes for the various reasons that Chris has already brought up and others. And so the regulations of duplexes should be taken as a category because chances are 99 out of 100, they're gonna get converted to non-owner-occupied. And then the last thing I wanna say very, very quickly is this is way too premature. There is no consensus yet that we need this kind of massive zoning change that are being proposed by two people, I'm sorry to have to say this, who have had no practical on the ground experience with any kind of permitting and don't really know the real estate market in this town and don't really know other than hearsay what, what's going on with the rental market. And so I think what we really need to do is do what it's been on the books for a while, money having been appropriated for a consultant, that we need to bring in somebody like Dodson and Flinker, which Northampton did, and build consensus so that we can put in, if we want to make massive zoning changes, put in what people can agree to rather than having something imposed on us that nobody understands. And so I just plea that when it comes back in March, try to find a way of consultants coming in like in Northampton over a period of time, meet with the groups of people or the okay, public, have multiple and come up with 
a proposal that we can live with. Thank you. Okay, Pam, and the next person with their hand up is uh, Fred Frederick Hartwell. Hello, Mr. Hartwell. Please give us your name and your address. You are muted. Let's see if we can unmute you. No, I have to ask you to unmute. So uh, uh, there you are. There you are. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes, indeed. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> the last time I couldn't get my mic to work. So uh, now I'm here. Good. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about subdividable dwellings. Um, uh, could you could uh, you give us your address before? Yes, you... certainly. 60 North Whitney Street in Amherst. Okay, thank you. In 1868 Victorian. And uh, I want to, yeah, su subdividable dwellings, the concept that uh, uh, I created the last time I was on the planning board, actually. Uh, so I, I actually wrote this and I live in a building that uh, if I were starting over, I would have uh, approached uh, the permitting authorities for permission to do that. Uh, it has enabled me to uh, uh, stay in a building for over 50 years. And uh, I've raised four children. At uh, various times, I have taken over parts of the building and included them into my uh, dwelling and then uh, subsequently redivided the building back to uh, uh, the, its uh, uh, more original uh, layout. It has allowed me now on a fixed income to have a stable uh, rental income that is not only stable and significant, it is also tax advantaged. There are huge advantages to this. People don't generally understand this, and uh, but uh, please don't remove it because it makes all kinds of sense and it will promote uh, stability in neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next person we have is Janet Keller. Hello, Janet. Please give us your name and your address, and you've got two minutes. Sure. Janet Keller, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. Um, I live in the co-housing here. Um, it's a planned unit development that was a 40B, um, and it's wonderful. Uh, so... Um, the, the proponents say this will make housing more affordable, but there isn't any evidence to support this claim. And instead, um, despite lots of uh, zoning changes that have loosened requirements, uh, only those with high incomes can even afford to rent here, let alone um, to buy and begin to build some of that equity that could be a cushion for all kinds of uh, emergencies in their lives and in their uh, older years. Um, um, and worse still, the proposal would further weaken critical protections such as the planning and zoning board hearings and abutters notices. Um, removing these protections would make it impossible for abutters to even know about plan changes, let alone request improvements in development proposals or uh, change a decision of the permitting authority. And as noted uh, previously, the, the, these proposals are enormously complex, small type, um, impossible. I've spent days um, trying to prepare for this hearing and I still feel very unprepared. But my final thing that I want to point out in basically beg you to consider is the only type of zoning that has actually produced affordable housing in Amherst is Article 15, the inclusionary zoning that requires builders to reserve 12% of the housing in each project um, with more than nine units for affordable rental or ownership units. Um, mm -hmm. And it works. Um, and I could cite number, numbers of, of 
of uh, projects, but um, I'll just make one that there, there will be 11 affordable um, units. Janet, I think you need to stop. Let me just finish the sentence at the building under construction at East Pleasant Street downtown. That wouldn't happen without um, updating Article 15. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, our next person, um, I believe it's Hetty Startup. Oh, it's Susanna Muspra is what I... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yes, Susanna. Hello, Welcome. Susanna Musprat, 38 North Prospect Street. Councillor DeAngelo said we have a housing crisis in Amherst. And I would just like to say that we have a housing crisis in Amherst that's largely driven by student demand for housing. And I would like to see you all concentrating first on how we're going to deal with this issue of the pressure that the demand from students is putting on the whole housing picture in town before you get into adjusting the zoning. Chris Prestrup on March 1st said that she didn't think the proposal was going to solve the problem you set out to solve of making a housing that's affordable for low and middle income people. And I think until you do something about the student housing issue um, and relieve that pressure to some degree, uh, it's even more hopeless to think that any number of zoning changes is going to accomplish the overall goal. So uh, even Mandy Jo, I think, has said recently that we need to deal with the student uh, situation, whether it should be a district for students or uh, regulating how many students can be next to how many non-students or whatever. We should be looking at what other university towns have tried and see what works. And uh, other people, not maybe not the planning board, should be talking to the university. The students themselves are now protesting and staying in tents. So let's tackle that and then get on to how do you make the housing that is here more affordable for the uh, workers and the families we'd like to have here year round. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Okay, now we now we have this startup. Mm -hmm. Please give us your name and your street address. Hello, Doug and everyone on the planning board and fellow members of the public. Um, sorry to um, dive in uh, earlier in the meeting. I didn't mean to do that, but just it was fine. just following the agenda. Um, so uh, thank you, Mandy Jo and Pat for this um, document and also to Chris for her um, thoughts about it. And uh, I was very happy to share the COVID memorial um, event with Pat and I play and sing music with Mandy Jo. So um, what I'm going to say really comes more from me as a citizen living in Amherst rather than being a member of the Amherst Historical Commission. And while I was, while I have been on the commission, I did for a while attend some of the design review board meetings. So I've been privy to some of the discussions about, I think it's 160 or 180 Fearing Street, where I felt there were some really good mechanisms in place to come out of that process with the developer who was fantastic to, to kind of end up with something that was going to provide um, hopefully some affordable housing. I, I know we're going to, we are going to have to de-densify, we're going to have to densify in town and around the village um, centers. Um, I know we have an affordable housing crisis, but I just think that in this particular instance, we're putting the cart before the horse. I really want to echo what Bruce and Andrew said about desi um, design standards. Um, towns like ours, Brookline, Northampton, um, Concord, Massachusetts, these are places that I think of as commensurate with Amherst historically. Um, and I think 
they've taken the a different approach, which is to look at their very substantial historic fabric and then build some design standards in place and then kind of tackle all of these um, additional issues um, as that happens. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, next person is John Varner. Welcome, John. Oops, where did he go? Did, did we lose him? Uh, here he is. Or this is John W. Which yeah. Is no. Yep. No, I don't have any comment on this section. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, there's, well, John, there's John Varner. Okay. Uh, John Varner, 54 <laughs> Jeffrey Lane. Uh, yeah, I would uh, also agree that the proposal is way too complex. I'd encourage that it be broken into pieces and, and um, introduced in stages, uh, considered in stages. And uh, I would also say that the proposal's lack of uh, oversight around, or loosening of oversight around some conversions uh, sort of, uh, it means that abutters will not have as much input into what goes on and what will affect their day-to-day -day lives and their property values. And I think the town has a duty to protect um, people in neighborhoods where changes are happening. Uh, certainly the housing crisis in Amherst is related to student housing uh, needs distorting the real estate market here in town. And uh, yet the, uh, the town seems reluctant to get uh, adequate data on student housing uh, where students are going, how how dense they are uh, infiltr infiltrating neighborhoods, and uh, any kind of behavioral or uh, societal problems that that they are bringing with them into the neighborhoods. Uh, Amherst is not collecting that data, so it's hard to evaluate the effects of students uh, expanding into the uh, general population. Is I would encourage that the the town get more serious about collecting that kind of data, and that's all I have to say. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And our last hand is from uh, Elizabeth Veerling. Hello, Elizabeth. Please give us your street address as you start. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, all. Um, Elizabeth Veerling at 36 Cotter Street. And not to beat a dead horse, but um, I did want to say that I do greatly appreciate the intention of the proponents of the bylaw changes to increase housing, which is clearly needed. Um, however, as we know, the housing crisis in availability and cost is state and nationwide, and is even a priority of our new governor. However, as stated by other people this evening, the crisis in Amherst is overlaid um, on this crisis is the pressure of over 10,000 students wanting to live near UMass Amherst. And so, as others have said, until the town really deals with this issue, I don't think any amount of zoning bylaw changes will bring us the kind of housing that is desired. So to me, these changes do not get to the main issue of the Amherst housing crisis. And I would like to see the same amount of time and energy that has been spent on all this discussion of zoning changes, spent on understanding how to deal with the very real need for nice student housing, for massive student housing, which is the main driver, as stated by others, of the Amherst housing market. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I see another hand. It's uh, Freddie Manning. Welcome to our meeting, Freddie. If you'd give us your uh, street address before you start, and you have two minutes. Freddie, you'll need to unmute yourself. There you are. I, I live at 61 Fearing Street. That is at the corner of Fearing and Nutting Avenue. Um, I just want to quickly describe a situation that has happened immediately, um, you know, in, in recent weeks. Um, the property diagonally across Fearing Street from me has been purchased by a developer. Um, it, has, we have had a very wonderful family who has lived there since the purchase, which happened, I think, last fall. Um, and I have just learned that 
the rent has been raised so much on the house that is on the property that the family is going to have to move. That is very disappointing because that means that the developer is going to go ahead and, and raise the rents to a point where no family can, can afford them. Um, I have lived here for 50 years. You may ask why I stayed in this house. It's a wonderful neighborhood. I am surrounded on all sides by permanent renters. Um, and I have, in, it's been a wonderful place to live, but it's not going to sustain itself in this condition for if, if it becomes more populated by unregulated student housing. I love the students. I go out on the sidewalk and I talk with them daily. Uh, I have, you know, it's it's a very lively environment that I love. And I would like you to all know that we do not dislike students in this area. I'm very, very fond of the, the energy and the life that they bring to it. And um, I, I would hope that you could somehow figure out a way to to honor the permanent residents and make life livable for them going forward without just thinking that it's fine to cram in a whole lot of student housing into this neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Freddie. Um, Elizabeth, I see your hand. Is that a legacy? Elizabeth Veerling. Uh, you'll need to unmute if you want to speak again. Elizabeth, are you there? Okay, Pam, why don't we put her back in the attendees and um, maybe she, that was just a legacy hand. Okay. Okay, so let's see, let's come back to the board. Um, I wanted to, since I hadn't made any comments, I wanted to just make sure of one thing that I understand about the two competing uh, clauses that are uh, not yet sort of come to consensus about. So I, I own a single family home in the RG district. And um, it's my understanding that if my parcel were large enough, uh, under the proposed language that's in Aqua, I could, as of right, uh, put a second unit on my parcel. So I'd have two parcel, I'd have a duplex, I guess, if I added it on to my house. And, um, but if I put more than two units, then I would need to do a site plan review. And if my parcel were large enough to put 10 more units, I could still do that as of right with a site plan review. So that's that's my understanding of the language proposed by Mandy Joe and Pat. Um, and then if I went with the language that uh, Chris was suggesting, it sounded like, let's see, it sounded like I could right now as of right put up two more units i could put a duplex on my parcel uh, as of right but if i wanted to put more uh, i'd have to do a site plan review and um maybe let's see i'm i've lost the language there but uh but uh, yeah so i could do i could do a total of three without doing Okay, so I no, I'm, I'm wrong. So I could do two with I could do three with site plan review. I could do one now as of right. I, the second one would be site plan review, and then Chris's language would after three I would need to go to special permit. So is that? I'm sorry for the confusion there, but it sounds was that basically accurate? Um, Mandy Jo and Chris, I see your hands. Mandy Jo, why don't you start? Um, basically accurate. I, I would um, say that yes, in the RG, 
um, if the, the the difference in the RG, RVC, and RN between Chris's proposal um, and Pat and I's proposal, the only difference is in the RG, RVC, and RN. And the only difference is when you get above four dwelling units on a parcel. Yep. Pat and I are proposing that that remain site plan review in the RN, RVC, and RG, um, as it is actually in the RVC, RN, RVC and RG currently today. Um, in the RN, it's, it's special permit. Um, and Chris's proposal is that when you get above four dwelling units on the parcel, you need a special permit. Um, that is the sole difference between the two proposals. There's some different language. Uh, Chris, I think, put all three sentences in. Um, we have two sentences, um, but the third sentence of Chris's sentence is actually the same as our second sentence, the R-O-R-L-D. There's no difference in that proposal at all in the R-O-R-L-D. Um, I would mention, though, currently with owner occupied and this is only owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes non owner occupied duplexes are back to what the current zoning is special permit mm -hmm. um i would also mention that the current zoning for owner occupied duplexes for example um has the language for an owner occupied duplexes one or uh, or both of the dwelling units serve as a principal residence. It's unclear whether that means if four buildings are built, only one of them needs owner occupied. Our proposal is requiring um, that it clarifies that to say each building must have an owner occupant in it. Um, and so Doug, when you're talking about if I were to build two more duplexes on my RG property and all um, site plan review or special permit. Well, both of those duplexes to fall under the yes slash site plan review would need to have owner occupants in them. Okay, so, um, so I have to- but Otherwise they would fall under the non-owner occupied duplex and by default be a special permit. Okay, so I'd have to send Sarah to one and my daughter to another or else I spend, uh, you know, Monday, Tuesday in one, Wednesday, Thursday in another, and we, we rotate, um, which may not even be allowed. Chris, did you want to say something on a more serious note? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I'm imagining that a developer could take advantage of this and build um, a development that contained owner-occupied duplexes as many as you can fit on the property and condoize them. And so you'd have a condominium um, development and it would probably have a homeowners, um, what do you call it, homeowners association. But in any event, it's larger than anything that has previously been contemplated for this type of development for um, by site plan review. And I think it is a an oversight um, in my language, I'm um, proposing to correct what I think is a, a negative oversight that might currently allow numerous innumerable owner-occupied duplexes on a property by site plan review. I think that's the wrong thing. I think that we didn't intend it that way to begin with when we created owner-occupied duplexes, we never contemplated that there would be more than one on a property. And this is a new interpretation of the bylaw. So my language corrects that what I think is, um, is, is an error. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. So I see, I'm seeing hands uh, popping up from more board members. Um, I will note that it's now nine o'clock. Um, and, you know, we could, we could go for hours tonight if everybody's got the energy. Um, but I personally don't think I'm going to have the energy. So we, we, you know, let's kind of all think about when do we want to stop uh, for tonight and we can, somebody can prepare a motion, maybe better than I did earlier, uh, that, uh, that we continue this hearing to some point in May. And Chris, I know you gave us a couple of dates to think about. Um, so Okay, with that, uh, at the moment, I just see Bruce and Janet. So Bruce, why don't you go ahead? 
Doug, you read my mind. Um, I, uh, given that uh, much of the material that we've been considering tonight, we only received uh, hours before the meeting, um, I would uh, move that uh, we continue this uh, um, hearing to whatever the date is, insert, and that at the continuation, we uh, deliberate on the duplex, uh, triplex section of the proposition in, uh, in the selected uh, zoning districts. And, and I would say selected zoning districts because I'm thinking perhaps not all of them, maybe it would be all of them, but I'd like to give, I'd like you as the board chair and to give some thought as to whether we would uh, uh, continue the meeting on the duplex triplex question in a in a discrete uh, bundle of zoning districts but i would the motion would suggest that uh, you make that decision as chair okay so i think there was a more concise motion in there yes i'll, I'll say it again uh, uh, do you i move that actually the, want uh, to make the motion now or do you want to hear from janet and then we'll come back to the motion well we can still hear from janet Okay, let's hear from Janet, then Then the motion okay, can yeah. be... Uh... So, great. So we'll, we will come back. Janet? Um, I, I agree with Bruce, and I'd like to talk... I want to figure out some way that we talk about this in kind of a logical sectional, like ways of sections. But to me, when you say triplex or triplexes, we also have to talk about converted dwellings and subdividable dwellings, because those are three forms of those are two other forms of triplexes that are being changed. And so I think we have to see how they work against each other or what's what are we losing. And so it might be just columns and like subdividable dwellings has this, converted dwellings requires this, triplex. I just need some logical way of talking about things and then realizing how things play out differently in different districts. And so it's like, this is like a game of like, it's like we're jumped in a, one of those kids things where there's just a whole bunch of balls and we're just jumping around and they're all moving around. And these things all, you know, these changes, every single change connects to other parts of the bylaw and the changes themselves. And so I feel like I need some way to talk about things. And if you're going to talk about triplexes, I want to talk about converted dwellings and, and um, why we've gotten rid of subdividable or, or can we take some of the good qualities of subdividable and bring it over. And so I just feel like I need some coherent path or some discussion that's really tightly to, you know, honed. I, and, I'll take that as a friendly amendment and I'll move that uh, <laughs> we continue this meeting to the date that Chris will insert. Well, I believe uh, we had May 3rd or May 17th as the proposals for the possible dates. Um, given the amount of uh, conversation about this I you know I'm going to suggest that we go to May 3rd so that we can keep this moving along uh, continued to uh, to uh, time on May 3rd and that we continue the discussion uh, focused solely on the duplex would you be okay with uh, changing solely to with a focus on the duplex? Yes, you know, it's going uh, the to be intent. The to, intent is to, to uh, give you the power to uh, uh, guide the conversation in in a, in, a, in a much more discreet and, and channeled uh, topic area. So it's okay. really for, it's this 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 is intended to give you power to help us do our job. All right. Does anybody want to second that? Um, I see Janet's hand. I saw that a moment before Andrew's hand. Okay. I'll second that. Um, could we also have some information about like how many duplexes we have and, you know, is it a popular thing lately? Things like that. Some. I don't know, Chris. Uh, is that something that we actually track as data that's easily retrieved or would that involve a lot of staff time to understand the population of duplexes in town. You are muted. There you go. 
I can ask the building commissioner if he has an easy way of figuring that out. Thanks. Okay. All right, we have a motion on the table. Um, Mr. Marshall, could you restate that motion? Well, okay, I'll take I'll take a pass at it. I believe okay. that Bruce made a motion that we um, continue the hearing to May third. Mm -hmm. um, I'll I'll put in six thirty five just in case there's nothing on the agenda yet. Um, and at that meeting, we uh, focus our conversation on duplexes. Um, the, the, the portion of this proposal that uh, addresses duplexes. And, um, you know, okay. Bruce, I know you were interested in also limiting the uh, number of zoning areas? Or Not so much now that we've uh, narrowed the, the house, uh, the, 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 the dwelling type. Fine with duplexes. Uh, wherever they were discussed yes and 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 i was only intending that we might consider to narrow the, the districts to give you the power to do that so if you don't want that then it doesn't, well, doesn't matter um you know i think i mean personally i'm not as concerned about breaking this up so oh okay um, you know, <laughs> if, if, if you want to if you know if people want to just limit us to duplexes uh, for next time as the kind of area that we can study on, you know, we'll, uh, we can do that, um, assuming everybody wants to go that way. Um, so that's the motion. Okay. Uh, Pam, does that, did it we does. get there mm -hmm. reasonably well? Yes. Right, Thank you. Um, so where did we land on the, the duplex? So the language? idea was that, you know, for, for class for next time, we read the chapter on duplexes, not the chapter on townhouses or triplexes or whatever else. And we will have a class discussion about duplexes. The other stuff can be extra credit. I mean, I, yeah. I do think we let's we should have something that we're focused on so we can try to get some stuff checked out the box. So okay. Sounds great. All right. Um, I have a question that I wanted to ask Mandy, Joe, and Pat, um, and and because I came at this whole thing in a different sort of philosophical lens. Um, you talked about the housing crisis in town. I come at this from the point of view of the climate crisis and the fact that we use too much energy moving around to get to the things we need to get to. And so I've always felt like we would be better off not increasing the density of outlying parts of town that are not served by public transit and that we should be building up along our main routes, uh, probably around the university, um, areas that people can access public transportation, use a bicycle or walk to their primary destinations and not be increasing the density in outlying areas. Why should I not follow that path? Uh, Mandy Joe or Pat, do, could, do you have an answer to that? So I, I wouldn't say we're not following that path with the most recent draft i think you'll notice i i believe the packet includes revision five of our flow chart for uses that puts all of the um proposed changes and and even non-proposed changes right all of the use categories with all of the permitting pathways in one page um and when you look at that with the most recent draft You'll notice that most of the changes in permitting pathways are now focused on the RN, RVC, and RG, which are those more dense areas of town. You'll notice that really the only changes in the RO and RLD, having listened to concerns and worked with the, the planning staff and all, are some removal of no's or some changes in permittings in the aquifer recharge. 
Um, but then the yeses of the duplexes that that triplexes are no longer, you know, are not a proposed use category allowable use in the RORLD anymore. Um, townhouses are not a proposed allowable use that it's not right now and we've reverted back to the current zoning in that um, converted dwellings are still a special permit that's what the current zoning is, although we've changed some of the aquifer recharge protection areas. Um, so, you know, I, I would say to your concern, Doug, um, we've brought the focus more closely to both uh, the increasing the opportunities for housing um, and potentially owner occupied and affordable housings um, in some areas, but now many of the permit pathway changes are focused in the more dense areas of town. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen. Um, I, I applaud moving ahead on this in a kind of a concise, um, breaking it up so that we can understand it and make some decisions and not get stymied with the whole thing. Uh, but I also think that we have to listen to the people that have called in. We can't just focus meeting after meeting on these um, zoning changes. They've asked us again and again to deal with the student housing problem. And I'd like to see that on the agenda too. How are we going to um, deal with the university in perhaps a more forceful way having or or in a way that we consult with them more so that they can use some of their land. They have vast amounts of lands that they can access from 116, for example, to provide the kind of housing that the students are demanding and asking for. They want to be there. They want to be together. We also want to protect residential things. So I think we can't just devote meeting after meeting to this zoning things. There are bigger global things that we also have to consider. Well, Karen, um, I guess I would challenge you, um, you know, it, to come back to a meeting with, uh, you know, something you wanted to talk about as a particular proposal, um, you know, and most of what we deal with is zoning. And so um, our ability to actually talk to the university is, is mostly indirect in that we, we talk to Chris and Chris uh, can talk to Paul and Paul talks to the university. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I think if we have specific proposals we'd like to do to zoning that maybe affect the university in some way, you know, maybe there's some leverage there, but um, okay. at least this, this committee or this board is, you know, kind of focused on that, that so part of the town regulation. Okay, so I, I'll come back with a specific proposal and make it more clear. Thanks. Okay. Um, Janet. So I, I would love for us to, uh, to, to um, follow the master plan. And I, I feel like we don't have to keep on revisiting and remaking the wheel. And Doug, the master plan says direct density into the village centers. It'd be nice if we delineated them and did design standards, which also says, and then bring people in and not just bring students in. It says we should have mixed neighborhoods, right? Mixed districts. And so if we focused our goals on that um, and just followed the master plan, we wouldn't be adding density to neighborhoods. We were trying to bring people into the village centers and we could, you know, we are going to spend hours and hours on this and, you know, which puts more density in a lot of neighborhoods. And so, and, you know, and the, the parts of the bylaw that say, yeah, you could have more density, but put it on a busy street are gone with these changes. And so, you know, I keep on, you know, we, we've, we've, the master plan, the, the town has adopted, you know, did it, the, um, and, and also just, you know, we're not just a zoning board, we're, we're a planning board and we are part of town government, but we are independent of it. And so if we had some recommendations to anybody, to, to the manager, to, UMass Chancellor to you know whoever wants to listen, I think we could we could do that and just make recommendations. People can ignore us, but we don't need permission 
to do things from Chris, who is, you know, staff to our committee or from the town manager, we're an independent board. And I think we should sort of think freely of solutions because we can offer them up based on our experience and hearing people and their day-to-day -day struggles in their neighborhoods and things like that. But I do think we should just get density and build the centers. Let's focus on that and make sure everybody can live there, not just, you know, pack the, you know, downtown with students, but have people living there and creating what we're supposed to do in the master plan. Okay. Um, Bruce. I Doug, with respect, to... I'd like to call the question. You would, okay. All right, so we haven't called the question too often on this board, so <laughs> I think we have to have a vote to- No, no, I, I, we can forego we the formalities of it if you choose to. I'm sorry, go ahead. What did but, you say, Bruce? I think we can forego the formalities. I, I don't want to force you to take the question, but I would, I think it's time. Did you have a second for the amended um, version yes. of your motion? Yeah, that came from, I think, from Janet. Janet. Janet? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, okay. In lieu of having a formal vote to call the question, I if, if, if any of the board members want to object to that, why don't you raise your hand or, you know, wave your hand at me? So I'm not seeing anybody who wants to continue the conversation informally at least. Okay, so, all right, uh, not seeing any more hands, maybe we can go ahead with our vote. And so this vote would, uh, a vote in favor is to continue the meeting to May 3rd, 6.35, did that work, Chris? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, at which point we will, continue to talk about this, this, this revised proposal uh, with a focus on the changes proposed to the regulations for duplexes in all zoning districts that are proposed. Okay, uh, Bruce, we'll start with you again. Nice. All right, uh, Andrew. Hi. Janet. Hi. Yo, uh, Johanna's gone. Uh, Karen. Hi. And I'm an I as well. All right. Thank you all, um, members of the public. We are going to continue this hearing on May 3rd. Uh, feel free to keep sending us your comments, your concerns. And if you come back on May 3rd, you can tell them to us. All right. So the time now, let's see. Thank you, Mandy, Joe, and Pat for joining us. Um, you're welcome to stay, but we're gonna go ahead with the rest of our agenda. And uh, we thank you for the time and effort you've put into bringing the proposal to this point. All right. Uh, next item on our agenda, item five, is old business, and it's regarding SPR 2022-14 with Center East LLC, 462 to 446 Main Street. Uh, in accordance with, SP, with, the, with the aforementioned SPR, decision con condition number 29, uh, I believe we have John Robleski here to update us regarding parking. Additionally, he will discuss changes that are proposed to the front sidewalk material, parking configuration, and the windows for units 26 and 27, signage for the buildings, and associated site changes. Uh, so welcome, John. Welcome Hi. back. Uh, that seems like a long list, and I'm hoping <laughs> it's not going to take us two hours to get through it. Yeah, absolutely not. All right. What have you got to show us? Well, if you want to start maybe with that condition number 29 and camera and my on video, or do you want that or just want me to speak? Uh, I think uh, it's really up to you. We can hear you. Um, okay, that's if not, fine. If you're not feeling visually presentable tonight, that's fine. Uh, yeah, regarding that uh, condition number 29, that's actually from the original permit from 2020. 
So it's an 18 month requirement to come back to you folks, uh, just to review the parking and see whether we need that additional six spaces. Uh, so in a nutshell, I don't think we do. It's been working out quite well. We still kind of maintain that ratio of 50% bedrooms to cars. I checked with the management company yesterday and currently there's 18 cars listed to the tenants for 35 bedrooms. <clears throat> then uh, I counted them this morning on the security cameras at uh, 2.50 a.m. There were 17 cars parked in a lot. And as you know, we've had construction going on there for the uh, phase two building. And a lot of contractors have been parking some in the front spaces just for convenience of getting their tools and stuff. And we've had no issues uh, with the tenants not having a place to park or being able to get in and out. So I think everything is working fine regarding that condition. And you know, if you have any questions on that particular thing, let me know. So you're saying it's, you're saying first that this condition was put in with the 2020 uh, site plan review for the first building, Correct. and and that uh, so it's been 18 months since since that uh, that complex opened, and that the parking seems to be working well, and that you're roughly at 50 percent occupancy on the parking spaces. Uh, it's fifty percent ratio of the bedrooms to the number of actual cars. Okay, all right. Yeah. Great. And you know, looking ahead, I think the management company doesn't anticipate any change to that. So with the new building, we're going to end up with uh, a different scenario with number of spaces, but it's still going to be around that fifty percent ratio, which seems to be working. You know, in that location, everybody is using a public transportation or going up Gray Street to uh, UMass. So like I said before, I think they have an app on their phone that shows them where that bus is coming up Main Street because all of a sudden there's like six people heading down to the bus stop and the bus gets there and they get right on. So it works out really well. Okay, all right. Uh, I see Janet's got her hand up. Maybe she's got a question for John. Hi, John. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions because we went around the, the circle on this one. And I just, some things to remind me, are, are you um, saying by lease that tenants can have parking? Is there like a yeah, lease restriction? If, if you remember, we had 47 parking spaces in the, uh, I'm sorry, 32 parking spaces in the original plan yeah. for 35 bedrooms. So the ratio wasn't quite one to one. Uh, so we had a lot of discussion about that, and I did those surveys early in the morning, went out, checked out parking space, so forth. So the bottom line is it seems to be working the way it is, and we don't anticipate seeing any changes in that for the new building either. So the tenant, any tenant can bring, have a car then, right? There's no re lease restriction. There's no extra charge? No, we're not charging any extra charge. So the tenants can, there's no lease restriction saying they can't have a car? Well, they're not assigned any space by right. Um, if you remember, there was language in the management plan regarding that. So we're not conveying any parking rights. It's like first come, first serve. Okay. And then, um, so you're just saying that, and then you are renting to students then? Because I thought you weren't going to rent to students. Well, but it's it mostly grad students. Um, I think we have like 11 of the units are international grad students, which stands for reason they, they're here to do one thing and they don't really have a car. They're used to using public transportation and seems to be working. Okay, and then do you have any idea how people food shop? Do they just take the bus and come back with bags? I know we, we were talking about that. A lot um, of deliveries. Okay, like food delivery. And I'm saying, well, who's this? You know, all of a sudden they're, they're on their phone and the people run out, they get their food and go back into their apartment. Okay. And I think that's, again, you know, just a method of how the international students are used to doing it. So do you also have people who are tenants who are just like regular Joes, like working kind of thing? Yeah, I've got a gal there that moved in in September. She lived in Amherst years ago and then lived somewhere else in the U.S. 
wanted to come back. So she's renting a one bedroom unit. And I would say she's probably in her early sixties, but she loves it. Um, she says, I like, you know, having the, like one lady said earlier, you know, having that young population around her and seeing the activity. And um, so, yeah, we got that person. We got the person still there from Florida that uh, is getting her second degree at Amherst College. Um, there's another working couple. There's uh, two units I'm renting to Kansaki Paper now. They're an international paper company from Japan. So mm -hmm. there's that mix, you know, that I had at uh, Spruce Ridge also and still have there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Janet. All right. So that uh, that covers uh, condition number 29. So... Uh, you want to move on to the parking or to the sidewalk material and the parking configuration and the rest of those items? Sure. Yeah, if actually the sidewalk, we'll get right at that. I decided to go back to the concrete. Um, you know, they kind of convinced me, you know, why would you want blacktop that cracks and so forth? So we're going to have all the sidewalks will be concrete. I think you have the latest site plan with the amendments that Jason uh, Skeels had looked at and had no issues with. So some of those items have actually already been done. So I'm looking at the email here that I sent. So if you want me to just go down that quickly? Sure. So the second transformer is not needed. So we had a space out in the front kind of behind the bus stop where a transformer was gonna go to feed the new building. Uh, they're able to swap out the existing transformer for a bigger one to handle both new buildings. So we don't need that area. Uh, the sewer line servicing the existing old 446 building uh, goes out to Gray Street, couple of trees out there and so forth. And I said, you know what, it'd be a good idea to cap that and have a new sewer line tied into the new sewer line to go out to the street. So Jason thought that was a good idea. That's already done. Uh, the roof drain structure, we actually, we're not able to put that in. We don't have one at the other site next door where all the roofs gutters go into it. Uh, there's a mainly a, a grading issue there and the elevation issue. We couldn't put a structure in. And it hasn't been an issue as far as gutters. There's not that many tall trees that, um, you know, drop leaves and stuff that are going to plug up the system. And there's inspection ports that we've been keeping track of. So... And then the existing sewer pump that used to serve the building that was demoed uh, is not servicing anything now. So we're going to remove that and just cap that according to Jason where he wanted to cap. Uh, the sidewalks, we just talked about that. There'll be concrete walks and uh, wood ramp going up to the existing uh, handicap entrance to unit 50, which is the old first floor of 446. And that'll be all done per ADA requirements as far as slope and so forth. The window okay. changes, I think you have pictures of those and the elevations. So one of them came about because we went to put the shower unit in in unit 27 and the window was too wide and we couldn't move it at all. So we had to put in a smaller window there, which kind of makes sense in a bathroom anyway. That's something I really just didn't see in the initial drawings and put it together that that was a big window in a bathroom. So that was the reason for that. And then in 26, it was a balancing issue because we got two double windows in the front. And I perceive that if we ever rent it, it's gonna be like an office with two sides basically. So instead of having two big windows in the front and then another window like four feet away from it on each side, we kind of move them back. So that's on the west side, we have the west elevation that you see there. Yeah. And then on the east elevation, there's actually gonna be two windows on the east side there, the bottom right. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we now have an extra window that we need to put someplace that's so we'll put it on the east you know they're going to get more sunlight from that side and so forth and it, it came down to where the hvac units are going to go if you remember there's like a double stand on the west side so it just made sense to add that extra window here 
And then as far as the numbering system, I think I sent you a copy of uh, Chris Baskin, uh comment on the way to number the building that I talked about way back is for exactly like that. So those are gonna go on each building and not on a separate little sign or anything. As you see in that picture that was just up prior to that. So it'll be very visible when somebody drives in which building has what units in it. And the numbering system, uh, so unit building A would be the building we did two years ago. So that'll have units one through 25. The building we are currently building in the center will be units 26 through 49. And unit the building C will have units 50 and 51, which would be the SDO 446 there. And now the address of 446 no longer exists. The uh, assessors already took it off the books and everything. So this whole site, as that email said back then, is 462 Main Street. And then the original sign that you folks approved um, is pretty much the same. Just we're playing with different color schemes to make it stand out, um, but the design is the same. Pam, I'm not sure that you have that. The, the entry sign. That. Is that design, but on two four by four posts, you know, that uh, and I think Nate made yeah. a comment that kind of matches the, the signs along Main Street better. So that'll that'll remain. We didn't get a uh, new yeah. view of the um, proposed the main sign. But if you're saying it's the same design and you're just changing the colors. Yeah, the same same shape. Um, I'm just playing with, you know, trying to blend the colors of the actual siding of the yeah. building. So we'll go here. Yep. It'll go there, yeah. And it will match these little signs. Pretty much, yeah. Same okay. basic design with the peak in the in the center, yeah. Okay. It kind of picks up that peak on unit 26, the front porch of the center building. This. Okay. So the last thing to talk about is the request for those three spaces that are currently in the front that we were done with the building two years ago. Right there, yeah. So there's where the handicap label is. That's an eight foot wide space. And currently there are two other eight foot wide compact spaces as it's indicated in the blue. That fourth space we added for the approval that you did two years ago, I'm sorry, last year. So I'm thinking, why does it make sense if all the spaces are not getting used to just leave it the way it is and have two more compact the way they are? This would be a handicapped space right there, right to the sidewalk. And then the event, same type of thing we just did with the 18 month review. If it comes down to being really tight, we could add that in the future, but there's a lot of work involved to tear up all that blacktop and have a seam where you really don't want to see them in the main part of the driveway there and adding like another 200 square feet of blacktop if it's really not going to get used. So, so you're talking you're talking only about the fourth space that's labeled reserve space? Correct. That was that's on your approval from last year of this new building. Mm -hmm. All right. So that gave us 47 spaces. So if we are able to keep those three spaces the way they are, the way the parking configuration changes is what I have in handwriting there. So the ratio, the approved thing from last year has uh, 18 full size and 26 compact. So the ratio of, let's see where I have that. The ratio back then of full size spaces to the total spaces of 47 is 38% of the total. So we we're able to do keep that as a reserve space. We'll have 15 full size, 28 compact, and three handicapped for a ratio of 33% of the total of 46. So it's not a big change. It just I'm looking at it as, you know, why add more blacktop if it's not going to get used and it's working the way it is. All right, so that's a request to the board to eliminate one space that we've approved. Is that right? 
That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, Pam, do you have the site, the site plan revisions drawing that you could bring up? Because I'm a little bit confused about the sidewalks at the moment. The drawing that I'm seeing has a bunch of walks that are labeled as asphalt uh, with, with yellow circles around them. Yeah, those are what Doug. Those are what I highlighted as the changes to the one that was approved. Another so issue that came so up. Are you so? Are you saying you want to install asphalt sidewalks or concrete sidewalks? No, we went back to concrete. That's what was approved. So disregard the asphalt on this plan that you're looking at. They will be concrete. Yeah, I guess the fact that this is labeled as a, a rev revised drawing with asphalt on it makes me wonder. Yeah, there should be. Well, maybe I didn't send that to you. Well, to give you the background. Here it is. This there, one. This one. This yeah. is the one. This SKL3 is the one that he's proposing right. for his sidewalks. Okay. Yeah. I, I okay. Think now, I here's, know. let me explain something. I looked at this plan saying, well, how can we make this a little more green space? So I looked at the elevation on the existing ramp, which is up by that number 98, up the corner, the upper corner, and it's 97.77 there. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan that you saw earlier and the plan that was approved with the sidewalk kind of in the center of that space between the buildings had a one foot drop in a five foot area. And I said, wait a minute, that's not going to work for handicap. So I had the engineers look at it and they said, oh yeah, that's not right. So there was a problem with the plan. So I came up with this solution. Well, let's keep the existing ramp to where it is, or the landing rather. So right at the top there, where it says existing concrete landing with steel handrails, landing to be leveled with Psychoflex right there, yeah. It's fine the way it is. It just got a little slope to the north that we can fill in with that leveling compound and then build a wood ramp right next to the house and have more green space right in between the buildings and have that sidewalk run right out to the front crosswalk that goes over to the existing front door of unit 50 and then it back out to Main Street. So it just makes the whole site better. And that uh, wooden ramp that's 8.25%, does that have to be an accessible route? That is an accessible route, yes. And that's the ramp, a ramp can be up to 8.33%. A sidewalk can be no more than 5%. Okay. So that's why this is a ramp and it has to have handrails on both sides. Okay, all right, great. Now that, that's why I put the 28 feet there. Yeah, they put uh, they forgot to change it when I asked them to go back to 8.25% versus they had it drawn at 8.33, which brought it to the full 30 feet, which is the maximum allowed for a ramp without another landing. So realistically, that wooden ramp is going to be about 28 feet. So it'll be a little bit closer to the existing steps. Okay. All right, Janet, I saw you had your hand up for a while. Did you want to say something? Oh, I just had a question about um, the landscaping. Are you waiting till the other buildings are done to like you to put in like, I think they're like inkberry shrubs to um, cover up the parking in the front, the cars parked in the front? Yes. Yeah, but I wanted <laughs> to get this, you know, reserve parking space, you know, verified first. But, you know, there's a lot of other things going on on the site. We have to get all the sidewalks in and so forth but you can do, before you can do a final grading. Because I wanted to actually see the west side there because they finished that infiltration system down behind a bus stop. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's a great time of year to get the grass seed down. But they said, no, we want to get everything done, loamed and spread out, and then, you know, hydro seeder or whatever, and then do all the landscaping. Okay. All right. Uh, so, John, anything else? I think you've touched on everything that uh, was in our agenda. And um, I guess the question for the board is whether we're OK with holding off on the reserve space, at least until we hear back from you in 18 months about how the parking might work without it. 
Yeah, I mean, you can set any time limit you want. I think uh, the 18 months, I just came up with that because that's what was on the prior permit. Right. All right, board members, how do you feel about letting uh, John leave that front area as it is and not go with the reserved space, at least at this time? Janet? So I'm fine with it as long as there's no lease restrictions where tenants are prevented from having parking. Um, Cause that was, you know, so if anybody can bring their car and they, you know, the whole bylaw is focusing on the need of the tenants for cars. And if they don't need it, then I don't see why we, you know, need an extra parking space, but it would be good to see what happens when the whole building is functioning. Okay. Great. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I don't think there's a need at this point. And John, I just uh, applaud you for you know doing the audit work and checking the cameras at three in the morning or whatever. Uh, you know, we talked about getting some some uh, some data to help drive how we're approaching our work, and that's certainly very helpful. So, thank you. Okay. Yep. Anybody else? Uh, I suppose have any objection to? leaving the reserve space out of the site plan for the moment. I'm not seeing any, any other hands raised or anybody visibly objecting. Um, John, I'll, I'll actually ask you, uh, do you have any problem with people parking on this property who are not tenants or, uh, you know? I have not. Okay. And do you have any? I'm pretty. I'm pretty vigilant about that. And if I see a car that I haven't seen before for a couple of days, I get a picture of the plate number and I send it to the manager company. I said, "Does this car belong here?" Okay. So you have every, all your tenants register their car Absolutely. with the management company. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Um, Janet. Where do people park for parties? Like, do they park across the street or around the block? You don't have parties. No, your tenants don't have parties or they're, they're international grad students. All they do is work. No, I, I'm to be honest, you know, <clears throat> all the years I've been renting, um, to be very honest, I happen to come home from Florida to check on things, you know, the end of March. And I drive from my house through the center of Sunderland and I'm going by Cliffside Apartments and that bus stop is jammed with kids. And I said, what the heck is going on? So then I drive into Amherst. Well, everybody's walking around with a Borg. And I said, oh, I said, kind of early for that. So anyways, I drove down to my 734 Main Street house. I said, you know what? I'm going to go down and check because that is undergrad stair. Sure enough, they had a table set up out front. So I started videotaping, driving to the front of the house. And of course they see, and they start waving, hey, hey, you know, big party. So I drove in a yard and I got their attention. So I got out and I said, well, who lives here? Nobody says anything. I said, I'm the owner of the property. Somebody has to be living here. One guy came up, he said, I'm on the first floor. I said, this ain't happening. I said, get these people out of here. To his credit, he did. 15 minutes, everybody was gone. So. You, you know, you kind of get that sixth sense from having been on a PD for so long, but uh, I do keep track of things. So, and it, that's, that's what landlords should be doing, in my honest opinion. I've seen that over the years. You care about your property, you take care of the property. Okay. Well, thank you for your report to us. And these seem like reasonable changes. And um, Chris, in order to ask John to come back in 18 months, do we need anything official? I think it would be a good idea to take a vote on everything that he's shown you. And then I can write a letter about that vote. And I can add to the letter that you've asked him to come back in 18 months to talk about that reserve space. OK. okay. All right. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we all agree that the changes John has approved, has proposed are acceptable and that uh, um, we'd like him to return in 18 months to talk to us about how the parking demand is working without the reserved space. 
that seem adequate as a motion, Pam and Chris? Mm -hmm. Great, yep. I see uh, Andrew's hand. You're itching to second that. I, um, I was actually wondering, would it make more sense and if it's not to owners to do it at 12 months, just so we have like a same period previous year? Because um, 18, I think, would span into probably another set of leases, perhaps, relative to the academic year. I, I'm not sure if you're, you know, when, when your lease is run, but I think it might be useful just to build some consistent data if we had kind of a, you know, success. I years. think if you do 12 months, um, the leases start September 1st for the new building and they renew on September 1st for the existing building. So I think if we give it another few months, even say 15 months, you know, to make sure you got a kind of a good feel for who's bringing a car. Because, you know, when 15. they first come, they may not have a car. Then all of a sudden there's another car. I think yeah, that's I mean, why I, we went with the 18. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking 18 would move us past September of next year, which is why I was saying pull it back. 15 sounds fine. But yeah, uh, that would be my only, uh, I'd, I'd request that modification to, to the, motion and if okay. you did that i would second it john would 15 months work so let's see if we're in april may june july come back next july of 24. yeah that won't give us quite a year in a new building though because these leases for this you know extra 23 units aren't going to start until this september right so that's I'll what i'm saying then. if you give it I'll that take it extra Okay. All right. Yeah. We'll, no, we'll good stay, point. Stay with 18. That works. Thanks. Yeah. So we'll have some spring data and some fall data. Correct. Okay. Let's see. We have, I, I guess, I articulated a motion. And Andrew, were, did you end up seconding that? I will second that. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and vote. Starting with Bruce. I approve. All right, thank you. Andrew? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johan, uh, Johan is gone still, and Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Let's five in favor, two absent. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, thank you all. And I hope the rest of your night doesn't get too long and I hope it gets warmer again tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's cold out there. We agree. <laughs> thank you very much. Night, John. Thank you and Bye. good night. Time now is 946. Um, Chris, was there any other old business not reasonably anticipated? No old business, no. Okay, uh, any new business? Um, Karen had an idea for some new business for the future, but I'm, I don't know if she wants to bring it up t today or wait till next time. I think I'll wait till next time, Chris. Okay. All right, uh, next item was Form A, a and R subdivision applications, anything? Pam, no, Pam, not, no? Okay. not tonight. ZBA applications, anything we might be interested in? Chris? I don't think there's anything new, but we do have the battery storage um, public hearing opening next Thursday, which might be interesting to people. Um, and then this is a proposal to install battery storage somewhere in town. Yes, I think I've mentioned it before. It's a proposal to install battery storage at 515 Sunderland Road, which is where um, Annie's Garden Center used to be. So um, the ZBA is going to open their public hearing next Thursday, and and we expect that it's going to take uh, you know a few nights to work through the whole thing. But um, in case okay. you're interested in learning about battery storage, that might be a good okay. time to attend the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Great, and maybe that conversation will inform the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Yes, and I think I asked once before if you had any desire to have a presentation i i'm not for, sure for the battery storage project yeah you yeah, didn't I, I, i've I didn't, mentioned it before did you have any desire to hear that i i don't uh does anybody else 
I'm seeing a couple of heads shake now. So I just encourage you to go to the ZBA meeting if or attend it if you okay. think you'd be interested, which you may learn something. All right. Great. Uh, upcoming SBP, SPR, and SUB applications. Anything you want to alert us to? Not really. Pam, do we have anything? No, we We're don't. <laughs> things that are being talked about, but nothing right. has come in. Right. All right. Planning. Okay. Then now we're down to the planning board committee and liaison reports. Uh, Bruce, you finally officially get to make a report on the PVPC. Uh, you're right. I do. Um, uh, th there was a meeting on April 13th. Um, I should say that um, these meetings coincide with the, my mon monthly NACF meetings which are hard for me to avoid because I'm the chair of that uh, board. So I have to buy out of the uh, the, the PVPC meeting at seven o'clock. Uh, they start at 5.30 and I had thought that they would probably be largely done by seven, but they seem to run till about 7.20 or so. So I'm missing the last parts of these meetings. But the, the one uh, the other day was uh, uh, largely due to uh, reviewing again the... Uh, they're heading towards a, um, a strategic uh, uh, plan for the organization and for its uh, functions and so forth in the in the outlying towns. And um, uh, th th this was a discussion, a report on the re re on how to how the organization should prepare to conduct that, how they what they need to do to get ready to commit to. Um, and they've got a consultant called. Um, uh, the Consensus Building Institute it seems like a good organization as far as I can see. Um, and they also mentioned was uh, um, municipal vulnerability preparedness grants and uh, and apparently a new version of those, which uh, I just thought, uh, Chris, you probably know about this, but it seems like a place where um, funds can be obtained. Uh, just uh, be, uh, the, the newer version of them supports apparently not just the the study, but also uh, the uh, the uh, enactment of uh, one or two of the major recommendations of the study. So they call municipal vulnerability preparedness MVP, which I guess is an easy acronym to remember. Action grants and MVP 2.0, which is the more interesting one, because uh, Anyway, they're 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 basically uh, available to towns, and uh, more recently to the uh, to the planning uh, organizations like uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning uh, Commission, and uh, I think they also reviewed the budget uh, at that meeting. But I had to leave before that was done. Okay, thank you, Bruce. CPAC, Andrew, you all quiet? Nothing to update. All quiet. Okay. All right, Tom is absent, so we won't talk about DRB. Janet, solar bylaw. Um, the exciting news is that next, a week from Friday, we're gonna have the first, like the report from the consultant GZA. And I think she's gonna be reporting on the solar survey results, as well as um, the solar assessment, which is the grid view of non-university or college properties um, like where can solar be, you know, like where, how much and where and what's excluded and things like that. So that should be super interesting. Um, and then we also had a presentation um, last week from Jonathan Thompson, who is the, um, I wouldn't say he's a lead forester. He's a, he's a longtime forester at the Harvard Forest. He's a forest ecologist and a forester. And they've been studying, you know, climate change and sequestration of, you know, the Harvard Forest, and he's worked on the decarbonization roadmap and the, the climate action plan. And so he talked about forests. Um, it was chock a block with really interesting information um, about how you know how much carbon is sequestered by the the New England forest. It's continuing to uptake. Um, he we talked about like selective cutting and logging versus clear cutting, you know, for solar and some of the impacts of that. And then um, he's also gave his, um, he's also being paid by Mass Audubon. 
and I forget who else to do a report about, you know, how can the state get to its goals in terms of solar in solar production without cutting forests or, you know, or putting solar on farmland. And that's coming out too. So it was just, I, I don't know, Chris, it was super interesting. I felt like I could have listened to him all day because he was like, he's been doing this really dense studies and these has all these different analysis is and there's a lot people don't know still and he was great at putting that in really concrete terms and you know and he offered to help us in the future chris do you want to add something i just wanted to say how even-handed he was i thought he um really explained his points well and he didn't come down strongly on the side of cutting or not cutting forests for solar um he just explained the facts and, and that's what we need. So I really appreciated his presentation and thank you, Janet, for bringing him to us. I, I think it was great. And, you know, you'd ask him a question, it's like, it's complicated. And it was, you know, <laughs> like one of the things is like half of the carbon in a forest is in the, the, the mass and the other half is in the soils, but no one has studied how much so carbon is in those soils. Like there's like one study. And so it was just, it was super interesting. Mm -hmm. It's on, I'm sure we can get you the video if you want it. Oh, are, are all your meetings on YouTube like the rest, on our, like yeah. ours are? They are. They are, yeah. And there's links on your Solar Bylaw Town website? Yep. Mm -hmm. Can we just, can you just Google that or do we have to get that from Stephanie? Because No, they can go to the Solar Bylaw Working Group website on our um, town website and right there under resources, you can get to the videos. Okay. okay. So, good. yep. Good. Okay, uh, and then Chris, anything on CRC you want to share? Um, I have not attended a CRC meeting recently um, because they're not, they haven't been discussing the zoning amendment. They've been discussing um, rental registration. I think they do have a zoning amendment um, meeting coming up, and I'm going to say it might be May 4th because um, I know it was going to be, it was going to be after tonight but I'm not sure when it's going to be. Anyway, I will be sure to attend and report on that. Okay. All right. Great. So we're closing in on 10 o'clock. It's 9.55 by my clock. Uh, I have no report from the chair. Um, Chris, any report from staff? Uh, how's your new staff? Our member? new guy is great. Pam and I just think he's terrific. He's really easy to work with. He's got a great personality. He's got tons of energy and he's not afraid of um, tackling new things and I think he's going to be a real asset to the department and he seems to get along with everybody so that's really good so what's his name his name is Rob Robert and his last name is Wachilla it's like watch and then Illa w-a-t-c-h-i-l-l-a -L -L -A. I think he said it's Slovakian that's the origin anyway he's a great guy and we were, um, we'll be happy when you can meet him. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Janet, I see your hand. Chris, I forgot to ask you this under old business. Do you have an update on the Bangs parking lot consultant report? Did that ever come out? The Boltwood parking garage report? Yeah. Did we? Um, that is, we have a draft of it, and the staff needs to review it and. Um, get some final tweaks, and then we can uh, reveal it to, I think we have to send it to the town manager first, and then it will be made public. Okay. Oh, and then the RFP? RFP, Nate is plugging away at it, and um, Rob and Nate and I are going to meet next week to talk about it. And okay. we realize that it's taken a long time, but with our staffing problems, we just haven't been able to um, move it forward as fast as we wanted to. Okay. Okay. All right. I have 9.57, and unless anybody has anything else, we can adjourn. Thank, Thank you, you all me. for sticking with us for another long night. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. And we'll see you Bye. on May 3rd to focus on duplexes. <laughs> okay. Got it. All right. Good night. Good night. Okay. We got to stop the recording. All right. Good night, Pam.
Good night, Mr. Marshall. Stop recording. Bye.